Hola y bienvenido a nuestro video. Hablemos de la nueva película de Disney, Encanto. Soy MBM y hoy me acompaña Caro. Gracias MBM. Hola mi gente y mis amigos. Uh, me llamo Carolina y yo vivo en... All right, I think we're done. Okay, I just wanted done. to make sure that we did enough to scare off our English only audience before we got to the actual good shit. <laughs> so, I mean, not not bad for a no sabo kid, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, no hablo español, people. Get out. Out. Now. Get it, out. You're going to have to leave. This is, a, this is a bi, tri, and multilingual, like, fest here. If you're in this for only one language, well then, girl... What are you doing? <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, uh, we are going to have ourselves a nice little talk here about Disney's new movie, uh, Encanto, uh, that focuses primarily on a Colombian family. And so I figured what better way to celebrate the true spirit of, you know, Latin America, of Colombia, like the entire culture as a whole and just uh you know have a good fun discussion where we just forget to invite the white people <laughs> totally for sure that that just makes that's like the whole of ftcr i think i think it's been a while since i've been I, on here I, <laughs> it's it's in our mission statement i make sure to have it refreshed every time that we try to upload stuff that is guaranteed to make us lose followers like we're trying to distill like pure fan base Get rid of everyone else and just get the nice, good, hardcore people that are in it for just our special brand of chaos. Yeah, so no no, no Sonic arguments today, folks. Um, do that mañana. Do that mañana. There's not even a hedgehog in this mañana. movie. Mañana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come back tomorrow. There should be another upload. I don't know. I think we're doing, like, Sonic Brick House or something. Who knows? Oh, God. <laughs> but, yeah, so, okay, to begin with all this. Um, so Encanto is a pandemic movie, is a movie that was produced, made partially in the middle of the pandemic, and so had a weird, like, release schedule. They were trying to do a hybrid of the whole, like, holiday release, because this was the Disney film for 2021. Um, and then they did a delayed Disney Plus release on Christmas. So, uh, how did you watch, how did you watch, uh, Encanto for the first time? Yeah, so, um, actually, my mom wanted to see it with me. And I kind of wish I did see it with her, but unfortunately I had to fly back for work stuff. So I waited until a month later where it got on Disney Plus and that's how I watched it. I was like, the, I watched it the first day of 2021. I'm sorry, 2022. You see how like recent times just blends time together? <laughs> but, time, time is irrelative as well as relative. It does, it, it means nothing at this point. But on January 1st, I watched it for the first time and then I watched it two other times and then another time at my job <laughs> with the kids <laughs> damn no i did the same thing just watched it just about as many times uh so it was the first movie of 2022 for you yep. i actually watched it in the theaters i've been a dirty boy and i've actually been watching movies in a movie theater um and this one was one that i i watched uh sitting down watching on a big screen luckily in a theater that was relatively empty i didn't watch it like the first weekend i watched it when uh i, I think it was like the tiktok hype i mean yeah i i, I mm -hmm. hope i'm not too old and being too much of a game gaming boomer here but like i mean i was down for encanto when it was like oh hey you know disney movie latin inspired like you, you know like we love coco we love coco we 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 would love to see a mexican movie that had something to do with other than the day of the dead but you know we love coco we've cried several times to coco i've cried multiple times actually the theater so... i watched coco in we were passing down the tissue box <laughs> during that scene someone just Fuck brought a tissue yes. box oh. <laughs> yeah it's so funny because someone just brought kleenex and during that one scene at the end i feel my shoulder get tapped and i look over it's this little kid who's giving me a tissue box I'm like wait where'd you get that <laughs> <It's like cracked. laughs> i mean is it too mexican to say that i brought uh flaming hot cheetos with me into the theater when i went to see encanto or yes. uh, is that gauche that's amazing. Um, I uh, wish I had Takis with me. Mm, I love so Takis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. So there was a lot of that, like, 
when it was in the movie theater hype. And then it really did blow up once, you know, they had the Disney Plus release, once everyone was able to basically rewind the movie infinitely. And now, you know, we have probably the biggest hit musical in, in a while, right? I'd, yeah. I'd say in a while. Yeah, well, we'll get to it when we do, but, like, one of the songs is literally, like, the most popular Disney songs in, like, decades, <laughs> which is, like, wow. I mean, I'm not surprised. I'm not even disappointed. No, of course it's, not. It's just, but it is, it just goes to show you, people love Spanish music. I mean, that was, like, one of the big lessons when I went to Europe was, like, yo, People go crazy for Spanish music, even if they don't speak Spanish. It's just, I don't know. Good. Just got to get into it. Have the rhythm, you know. We have the best music, so, ha, take that, America. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it wasn't, like, the initiation of the development. I think it was from uh, the composer. So, you know, yeah. all the music in this movie is done by uh, Puerto Rico's own Lin-Manuel Miranda. Hot off of Vivo. Hot off of Tick, tick, boom. Hot off of In the Heights. Hot off of... I mean, Stefan said this to me in, in a chat. And I think yeah. it's the most apt thing that this year's... Or this this year's coming up, the, uh, the Emmys, the best original song is just going to be a category of <laughs> Lin-Manuel competing <laughs> against himself even... <laughs> to see which of his songs is just the best. I didn't even think about that. Oh, my gosh. And I loved In the Heights, too. Um, so, I mean, The Heights yeah. is... Is great. I think that was more. That was probably what got me more on board for Encanto. Yeah, was um, that you know, like I know his style of song composing and writing is at this point it's pretty easy to say it's divisive. Like there are people that really do jive and really like it, and there's just some people that really don't don't like it. Yeah, some of those I've noticed are more on the. Uh, <clears throat> systemic side of criticism mm -hmm. but you know I, I i'll admit that there are some people that just don't really like like his way of, of of songwriting and that's fine i mean music's objective you like what you like you don't what you don't but i i feel like some people get like crazy mad at his style when it's literally just you know a style it's just like your own thing you know like i don't know some people just dive into things a bit deeper than they should have i see it in the wrestling community all the time <laughs> how oh, is this is time. it okay <laughs> it's always a thing where it's always a thing where people are like not to not to take it off topic but it's always a thing where people are like oh well john cena's the best or jo i don't think john cena's like for me you know and then there are people who are like john cena needs to die and blah blah blah, blah and i don't want to see him again if he loses his job blah blah blah, blah. and i'm like come on okay 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 come wow. on now come on now hold on hold wow. on <laughs> People really just get that mad at people in spandex? Yes. Oh, oh wow. my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, like, are they mad at the spandex, or are they just mad at what the people are doing in the spandex? They are mad at what the people are doing in the story. <gasps> and because of that, um, they attack their, like, actual, like, you know, actor, I oh, guess. Oh, oh, this is, this is like when, like, uh, this is like when you point out a flaw in a online in like an old rpg and then people are like how dare you insult me it's like wait, wait what what happened here <laughs> i get you i get it but yeah with the release and with you know the just kind of the inspiration there um i i figured that like a lot of people were probably inspired to see it due to that representation angle of it because i mean like you said your grandmother wanted to watch it with you and i feel like that's something that always adds to like you know the argument for representation like you you'll find a million stories on twitter of you know five-year-olds you know finding a character that looks just like them yeah. and watching them like get extended like those alone i feel like should close out the argument like that alone it's like D dude it's something that makes kids happy in like in this art that people are creating but i mean to, to add into it representation matters as well because you get these movies where people like us can have our abuelas finally come to us and say they want to watch a disney movie with us after having to endure years of wanting to watch stuff with them yeah and they didn't watch shit anyone watch harry potter because that had blue head yeah yeah they didn't mm. want to watch power rangers because it's Spandexy men. What? I guess she also hated the spandex men. <laughs> oh I don't gosh. know. You explain it to me. I oh, don't. For Power Rangers? But, like, who knows? 
but I'm pulling from my own experiences here. I only had this one life. It's all the only experience I can right. pull from. But no, and that's where like you get these situations where you know I I I've loved the whole like memeage of this movie too, where it's you know every Hispanic like millennial now gets to have this therapeutic moment where we sit down watch an awkward movie about tense family awkwardness and just stare our relatives down uh-huh. and be like, hmm, yep hmm, how does this make like it's like a rorschach test of doom just how does this make you feel and what do you see in this scene abuela tell us tell us it stares at grandma aggressively i love you abuela <laughs> i do i miss you I love you. That's the, that's the only reason we're grilling you. We just want you to be the abo- the best abuela you can be. It's just going to involve some uh, mood adjustments. <laughs> but but yeah, no, but that was and I know that that's kind of Disney's role right now. They're trying to be as inclusive as possible so you know the most amount of people watch their movies so that the most amount of people go to their parks to buy the most amount of swag and make them billions and billions. like I I get it. I like the machine turns. And it's turning very well. It's like the mouse will mouse. Mickey Mouse needs to do it. Mickey Mouse needs to do. The mouse go mouse. Mm-hmm. But if I get a movie out of it that, you know, again, lets me see me, lets me watch it with my family. And again, also lets me, you know, talk out some traumatic things with my family. Well, I mean, you're just checking all the boxes here, Mr. Mouse. So, um, so like, I, I was excited for this movie, and then to have the movie actually blow up and be as successful as it's been, because it's been a hot minute. We've given it some time for, for things to settle down in terms of, like, discussion and discord, but yeah, I'd say all in all, like, that was a fun ride, I'd say, right? It's weird, because the first time I saw this movie, like, when the credits were, were rolling, I was like, oh, wow, this, this is a really cool movie. I don't know if it's, like, my favorite Disney movie, but, you know, the representation was there, checked all the boxes, emotional trauma, blah, 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 etc., etc. I miss me, abuela, and the rest of my family. You know, it's a fine movie. <laughs> and I don't know if you had the same experience, but Encanto actually got better <laughs> the more times I saw it. Because the second time, I was like, oh, wait, this is a great movie. And third time, I'm like, oh, yeah, let's go. We don't talk about Bruno, no, no, no. You know? <laughs> and then you know all the words. Here. Uh-huh. But no, I I was because uh, in the theater I was a bit distracted, so it was fun. I, when I ended up watching it again, I think it was Christmas Eve. Yeah, it was Christmas Eve because I I had I had Puerto Rican Christmas, so we had it the day before, and I was like, all right, everyone, we've got to watch the family movie. Fun times, great cast, great everything. But mm-hmm. I guess we'll we'll actually kind of talk a little bit about it. Now we've kind of like talked like how it, it it was all hyped up and just sort of the initial reception because i think it was stayed positive got bigger and now we're all just kind of happy and jiving along i definitely feel that the reception got a lot better once it hit disney plus and like it it tells you that like that was the game changer yeah and like it tells you that like the future of movies whether it's a good thing or a bad thing depending on what viewpoint you look at from like it really is with streaming services because we did see a lot of movies um during the pandemic switch from movie theaters to dis- to different streaming networks and stuff and even like movies like mortal Kombat, where um it was showing on hbo max and in the movie theater or movies like spider-man no way home where it was only in the movie theater not streaming on disney plus i know why you did that screw you mouse <laughs> but like we're streaming- watching you mouse but streaming is really like a game changer here and um Encanto will probably be like a big, 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 and it already is like a big, big example of um, just that. The, the, the genre of musical like lends itself to this. Mm-hmm. I mean, like like we like you mentioned, one of the songs here becomes the most streamed, and like that obviously doesn't get picked up as that doesn't pick as much traction. You know, when you have to shill out fifteen dollars to see the movie one time, but as soon as you're able to, you know, replay that sucker infinite times for your three-year-old for your four-year-old and you like have that movie on insta replay oh yeah like that that's instant like not not to use like the more recent term of of meme but like that's mimetic like that will drill that into your psyche into your brain forever now like (laughs) it's not going away right like could you imagine if like Disney Plus existed 10 years ago and Frozen came out on streaming services like a month after like the fact that it was in theaters. I, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of where that's, that's that's a lot of like the consideration like when you see like 
how successful or how much of an impact has Encanto had. Like, I mean, that's kind of the comparison now that it's going to, which is a good comparison because, you know, Frozen for a while there has been, like, the pinnacle Disney movie. Mm -hmm. Like, despite what may or may not have been your favorite, what's your childhood favorite, like, Frozen was the most popular Disney movie, like, around. Like, every child knew it. So to be, like, now to have those comparisons that, like, Encanto is possibly on that level is going to be on that level is on that level like that's that's higher praise that's a pretty good i think it deserve i think it deserves to be on that level uh, uh, same 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 absolutely like yeah. I, I absolutely do like if anything i'm reveling in it i'm kind of glad that frozen's getting dethroned like especially since i'm not at the point yet where the encanto music uh, is annoying yet it, it's gonna get there I'm, I'm fully prepared for it yep it just hasn't happened yet and so I'm just going to continue to, to loop and replay the soundtrack, you know, until it does. Well, so far, I will say that um, I have not gotten tired of Encanto soundtrack um, compared to Frozen. Because, like, after one week of Let It Go, I was like, ah, 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 no. In comparison <laughs> no. to other uh, Lin-Manuel uh, soundtracks. Because, I mean, like, I like In the Heights, but I don't really... I watch the movie more times than I listen to the soundtrack. Like, I think I, in yeah. that case, I like I like the full movie like, I love the dance numbers. I love the setting. I love the big numbers and everything. Um, and then and then Vivo is cool. I think it's a little too on the kid side for me. Yeah. But it's definitely Lin-Manuel's style of music. We'll probably get into it later. But he loves this thing where one person sings a thing and another person sings a completely different thing. And then he has those two people sing their things together. And then sometimes he'll make <laughs> even more people sing it, and like he does it in everything. Like yeah, he, he does it. He does it in Vivo. He does it in Hamilton. He does it in In the Heights. And like that's probably like to me, that's like the only thing I could feel like the most like ha- would have like a technical irk. Like it's a little annoying because how am I supposed to sing along, good sir, if there are five lines? Right. You see my dilemma here. I cannot sing all the parts by myself. I have to. I have to have people join it. Well, why don't you just like duplicate yourself? I mean, what I could himself. probably do is use a recorder on my phone and just like low low tech DJ record the one line and then play back while I sing the next line. Just do something like that. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. It's super possible. Yeah. So yeah. So a lot of this movie did come from you know Lin Manuel developing, wanting to do like a, a Disney movie, his style of music, his production, and everything. Um, and then another thing in the production of the movie is that the movie itself is based on a book. Uh, it's based on um, it's based on the book A Hundred Years of Solitude. Uh, it's by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, he wrote it in 1967. And this book is shenanigans. It's bananas. L- literally bananas. I try to read it to kind of like, ooh, get a good vibe uh, in terms of discussion for this. But the book is intense. Uh, So, like, this book is a literary masterpiece. Like, it's won Nobel Prizes for literature. Like, this is a book that kind of exposes, like, things about humanity. It's a really great book. The only problem is that it's about a multi-generational family. Uh Uh-huh. Oh. But in in the case that there's, like, seven generations of family. And, like, each generation has multiple members. And so it's a... It, it's about the, the, the Buendia family, and there it's you start off with uh you start off with uh Adeliano uh Buendia, and the thing is you get a bunch of people with the same name, and some of them have like the same character traits. So you're oh not God. even sure while you're reading the book <laughs> who they're talking about. The s- they you just hear them talk. They're just talking about Jose. But you don't know if this is the Jose from 50 <laughs> years ago, Jose from 300 years ago, present day Jose. It's it's crazy. And like you would need a family map to like keep track of it. So that's where I was kind of like, I don't know. Like I, I tried even audio booking. I was like, maybe I can just zone out and like hear it and get it. No, I was so lost. It was it's it was crazy. But I, I felt at least to like look into it to sort of see like what was really taken from the book into the movie. Because it's not a one to one translation. I mean, we're talking about a a Disney adaptation. There's a reason like people go batshit crazy when their books get adapted by Disney. Like you're getting something completely <laughs> different. Um but in this case with, with Encanto, you know, the big main themes are um 
the a family element, yep. multi generational family element within the culture of Colombia, within the history of Colombia. Um, in in the book, like it's it's essential. Like there are things in it to such as like the the United States. Uh, the United States kind of comes in and sets up a banana plantation. And there's a worker revolution. And so uh, the United States Fruit Company decides to just uh, murder all of the workers to, to yeah. settle, to quell the revolution. It's like how – that's very American. Like that's that's the accurate stuff. So that shit. sounds very, very vintage American. <laughs> I'm surprised we didn't get that in the Disney movie. Hello. Oh my where was that? <laughs> where was those shenanigans? Honestly, the way that you're describing this book, I kind of want to read it myself. Because I remember what you texted me, like, a couple weeks ago. Because I did remember that you were reading this book. And I was like, and you were like, this is, it's literally Colombian Jojo. And I'm like, oh my gosh, really? And then you're describing it here. And I'm, and I'm sitting here laughing, like, oh my gosh, it's really Colombian Jojo. <laughs> it is. There's, like, a plague. There's, like, the, they, you, you start with the city being founded. And then there becomes this whole weird, like, time loop that would make the never-ending story blush. Like, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. So I would recommend, you know, especially if you can handle, like, a big cast, I would recommend reading it. Because like, it, it talks about a lot of neat stuff. Like, yeah. things like cyclical fate. Stuff like repeating the sins of, like, our ancestors. Of, like, that intergenerational effect. That the way your grandfather treated you affects the way you, in turn, treat your grandchildren. Is It's a lot of ideas like that. And then, again, just that whole backsetting of Colombia. I mean, let, let's be honest here. Colombia has is always in a civil war. It may not always be, but it is just about always in a civil war. So, I mean, it works to show just that kind of strife of, like, human existence. So I'd I'd recommend it. I didn't read it myself, but it is really – I think it's really neat to kind of, like, know about that just in terms of, like, how that – when they were making this movie, this, like, sensational, like, family-friendly movie, that it's based on a book that, like, really looks at some dark things about humanity. It's like, cool. Thanks, Disney. (laughs) Thank you, Disney. Thanks for that. But yeah, so instead of the the, the Buendia family, uh, Encanto focuses on the Madrigal family. Yep. It's, the movie starts. I like how the movie starts with that whole bilingual opening. If you're watching the English version, which uh, I, I don't know if we mentioned. It. Have you seen the movie? What languages have you seen the movie in? Because it's in so many languages. Um, now, I've right? only seen it in English. I really want to see it in Spanish. Now that you mention it. Okay. Yeah, but I've only seen it in English. So when that first couple of lines opened up, I'm like. <gasps> It's Spanish. <gasps> my language, it's, my it's culture. So <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Mi gente. Um, yeah, I, I've only seen it in English, but I've listened to a lot of the songs a couple times in Spanish because some of the songs get some nuance in Spanish. Like it's kind of one of those, you know, like Japanese subtitle type things where like you get this weird like third meaning in the middle. Right. Um, so I, I at least, I've, I've given it a couple listens to at least in the Spanish side. The voice cast on like all language side is kind of phenomenal there's a mm-hmm. reason they have like the whole uh the bruno song in multiple languages like they disney is really wanting everyone to go to disney world They're like you better fucking go to disney <laughs> world or they will bop you uh, but yeah it starts obviously with the open your eyes uh abre sus ojos so you get abuela telling uh our protagonist our first bespectacled protagonist i guess that was like a big deal or something but uh you know have... i didn't even notice that she was like the first spectacled protagonist <sighs> it's always one of those things it's like you know first gay disney character where it's like we've had at least a dozen technicallys already y- y'all just don't want to have the first official because then you can keep dangling it, it's a carrot like they yeah. keep just holding it out in front of you they're like "Ooh, come see this movie there might be some gay in it Ooh, nope bet. come see the next one it's like just stop just <laughs> but it yeah the movie starts with that bilingual moment and then you get a little bit of a flashback uh which i i notice a couple of diff- details when it comes to uh this scene that we get of uh abuela's past because it plays a couple times in this movie. There's yeah. not a lot of things that you get to see a couple times. Uh, but the the scene that in the beginning, you see it later. A little bit different. And I think the differences are kind of really important and actually make it way more sad. When it doesn't even need to be. Yeah. But we get the opening. We get the setup. You know, it's Colombia. So there's conflict. And thus, there are refugees. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
so we get the whole scene where Abuela and her husband, they flee their village. You see them fleeing in a caravan. There's a bunch of people. And we get a moment where the where the husband, Pedro, doesn't make it. And instead, uh, Alba is blessed with, with a miracle. She's given a miracle, a blessing, a yada. I, I'm sure there's like all kinds of weird translations that they had to do for that. El milagro. <laughs> uh, which, which includes um, the mountains uh, rising. Um, a lot of the changes, I mean, it kind of fits into like a fun little theory that I've heard around the, that a lot of what the candle does is in for the sake of the security of the family. Like the mountains create, they call it the Encanto. They call it like this enchanted safe place. And then also leads into her family receiving magical powers. Yay! A, a la X-Men or I don't know, maybe JoJo's dance. We might, JoJo's the, 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 the whole dance. Colombian JoJo thing might be yes. more on point than any of us realize. My gosh. Um, it's... It's, Gen- it's genius so comparison on your part <laughs> thank you thank you i love it um but but really it's more to tie into and this is also kind of in with uh 100 years of solitude um the the, the type of genre that the book is is magical realism um which is a very a very latin american um it, it, it it's a it's a point of pride for a lot of latin american yeah. authors like they actually had to fight for their literature to be acknowledged as magic as magic realism as its own genre that was birthed from latin america with like that mixture of colonization the indigenous influence the spanish influence the globalization at the time and so um it, it led to a lot of writers and a lot of our artists at the time uh, leaning into a, a lot of works that you know depicted the real world, but had magical features to it that were stated very matter of factly, you know, very yeah. much in the style of you know being experienced to a lot of different cultures. Like, oh, he eats lizard on the stick. He's like, well, yeah, that's what he grew up eating. Like, it's kind of in that matter. So you know, lat- so with Latin American artists and with that literature at the time, you have those aspects, and so. Um, that's also where that you get that inspiration for the Madrigals having those magical powers is um, in that magical magic realism uh, genre. Um, and that first song too, when they're introduced by Mirabel, she sings it very point of factly. It's not like, oh, Dolores can do this and it's the weirdest thing and we don't mm-hmm. know and everyone avoids her. It, it's not uh, something that's like that emphasis is put on. It's day to day life. There's an entire village of people that are just super cool with superheroes living on their block. It's just part of the magic realism. So um, I think that's also really, and a lot of stuff goes into it later, like in terms of tying the powers to the characters' personalities too. Yeah, like having th- having thought of it now, like um, there is some like. I did read like oh my gosh I'm trying to pull back a memory like I'm just making the connection between like magical realism and like um Latino culture but like um in high school um this one class had to read um I don't know if you've heard of it like water for chocolates I think it's called but the writer was Mexican and like I've I've heard it and I think I had to read it but maybe yeah. did it get around to it but the title's familiar yeah and like um I forget entirely what the book is about but um there is a lot of like mexican culture in that book i think it actually does take place in mexico but like i just never never made that connection now interesting the more i learn Mm -hmm. i suppose (laughs) (laughs) yeah i got super interested uh just kind of when i saw it at the end when it was like oh based on yada yada like i was instantly like okay what is what give me the dish like if that was the fun ver- if that was the disney version of this i got i was instantly hooked and ready to see what was the then well you like you see it beauty and the beast and like sleeping beauty you read an actual grim fairy tale you're like holy you're shit. like oh my gosh her, her book gets chopped <laughs> off like d- i forget like in cinderella or something i i can't remember but i think in one of cinderella, the, fa- the stepsister I- yes like in one of the yeah. grim fairy tales like someone's foot gets chopped off or something it's wild the, the the sister's foot is so big that it doesn't fit in the shoe so her solution to get the shoe to fit is to hack off bits of her foot yeah, that's so what that it, was. it fits in a dainty size four you know you can't get that with disney so <laughs> yeah well the dad and then like uh 
Hans Christian Andersen, you know, yeah. when, you, when you get the sad, when you get Ariel's sad ending, when you don't get the true ending to the Little Mermaid, and she just vaporizes into bubbles, and you're like, oh, but why? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we have this backstory of the grandma, the miracle, and the town. So I don't know if this town is given an actual name in the movie, but in in a hundred years of solitude, it's all based uh, it's all based in a town called Macondo, mm-hmm. um, and it's meant to be like this paradisey town. It's again same similarities, small town, middle of nowhere, not really affected by like the industrial influences at the time. Uh, that's another thing about Encanto; it's kind of an ambiguous time. Uh, the technology puts it to where they're not super industrial, but yeah. they have a camera. So there's flash photography. Yeah, like they never, spe- I know they never specify the time period. They never specify the town. And actually, um, I did read into this, like the team that actually went to Colombia um, to do field research for this movie, they went to like, they went to the major cities like Bogota, but they also went to smaller villages. So like that town in Encanto is just like a conglomeration of inspiration from all the towns that they visited. So they have some elements of like the larger towns and obviously elements of the smaller um, villages. And then, so we get the town and we get the family introduced, obviously in song, it's a musical. It's going to be, it's going to be that way. Uh, But we see that, you know, Alma's all grown in. She was already grown up, but now she's grown in. She's done graduated (laughs) to abuela dumb. Um, Oh my gosh. That I, I like that. (laughs) I, I, I love that when I'm like, 60 i'm going to self-declare myself as being graduated into abueladom into abueladom you don't necessarily have to have grandkids you can just be an abuela it's a state of mind yeah really. <laughs> just stand around make tortillas the occasional chile colorado for breakfast Yo. and just ask people if they're hungry every hour no no if you don't ask at least every hour then not true not that true abueladom um <laughs> Can, can you tell that I had a blast, like have, <laughs> hearing like just all the same familiar terms that I use yeah. for my own family? Like, is this what Jerry in Ohio feels like every time like a Christmas movie comes on and they go to grandma's house? Like, is this that feeling? Oh my god, she's making cookies just like my grandma. Oh my god, <laughs> she's got <laughs> she's got a grand piano in the, the basement just like my Christmas is as a child. <laughs> the, the fucking grand piano. <laughs> Uh, so we 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 there were triplets right and they're all grown up so you have uh hold on you have peppa Mm -hmm. who controls the weather based on her mood so she doesn't have full control she's not like storm omega level mutant like could end civilization if she wanted to she's just more like I don't know. she's got mood issues and that's fine that's okay she's got family to support her through those um you have Julieta, who can... It's not super specified, and I don't think you're meant to, like, get the details. But her food can heal you. We don't know if, like, the cooking is what makes it magic, or just literally she just has to, like, touch a bun, and it's instantly, like, imbued with her power. Or, <laughs> like, she's, she mentions in the movie that it was her love. And I know that's meant to be, like, as Aww. a quirky, like, oh, she's just being a mom. But, like, I don't know. I kind of want to take it literal and be like, can she, is her power more that she can imbue things with healing love? It just happens that food is, like, the easiest way for her to do that. But, like, she could probably do, like, a, like hands on a broken bone and, like, if it together. I don't know. <laughs> the love of, I think that'd be fun. The love of a mother. Just like my mother's cooking. Because I feel like she always sees it with love every time I see her. And it's like, I can't, it's I, like, you ever try to make, like, a recipe that, like, your mom made? And you're like, okay, this tastes good, but I like the way my mom made it more. Because, <laughs> like, um, Every time. I I have yet to replicate my mother's paella. I have yet to make my oh. abuela's chile colorado. Mm. I it's so bad. Like I try so hard, and it's just not the same. It's, no, <laughs> I'm a mess. I've tried forever to like make my mom's ceviche, and like I love ceviche, and like the ceviche I make is fine. It's not my mom's, and like carapucra, arroz con le- leche, and arroz con pollo, and oh my god, I'm making myself hungry. Damn it. <laughs> I mean, I'm hungry. I'm glad I had a snack before I, we did this recording. Same <laughs> Damn. <laughs> uh, so you had Peppa, Julieta, and then you had Bruno, who we don't talk about. So we're just going to move on. So Peppa married 
Felix. And let's stop right here because I this was I know one of your points that you talked to. Uh, you texted me about it. And I think this is a really big point too with mm-hmm. Encanto. Uh, just because it kind of shows we already have seen now like huge change in like how, I mean, we again, w- one thing that we like about this movie is that there is great, you know, Hispanic representation. There's great Latin American representation. But we're also learning like what that also truly means very recently as well too. Yep. Um. So I I don't know if maybe did you want to uh take take this topic then? Yeah, so um so I'll take it back to In the Heights because this is where I first saw this discourse like happening. So In the Heights, I love the musical. It's great. It's awesome. But one of the pieces of um criticism that came with that movie was the lack of um black latino afro latino representation in the film. And um for context cuz I don't think this is something that I've talked about ever like anywhere but my mom's side of the family in peru has black roots specifically um origins in africa so that is actually a big part of my ancestry and my culture and i've been diving i've been diving into it recently in um the last few years and it's just been a really incredible experience i've learned so much and it's absolutely like invaluable to me so to actually see that represented in a mainstream Disney film, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, this is like a side of a side of my family that means a lot to me. It was just so awesome to see that. Again, representation matters, mm-hmm. and good representation mm-hmm. really matters. Like if, if you go for it, you have to really go for it. And and I'm glad again because this was something we're seeing the change as recent as from in the heights to Encanto because yeah there was a lot of criticism that was like put very almost personally on on Lin Manuel yep on you know ensuring that like if you're going to do a representation of our culture of of, of community of all of that y- yeah there's there's that there's ineffable like if there's a truth to that that there. It, there's a black component of Hispanic everything, not just the culture, not just the people, not just in, it's like it's like it's history. And yep. like, you, you can't. And, and, and it's definitely something that like, you know, that there are issues of colorism in, you know, the Hispanic community, in Latin American mm-hmm. communities. And that's something that needs to be worked on, too, both like internally with pe- from people in the community. And then, you know, on the greater scope, as always, is, you know more representation good representation because it matters again not just for the five-year-old who gets to see literally it's so sad you know you have five-year-olds happy because they get to see a character with curly hair like curly hair is more predominant in the world like it's kind of one of those things where it's like when you like when you find out muhammad is one of the most common names on the planet yep it's just like just because you don't hear it on this half of the planet doesn't mean it's not happening literally everywhere else so I mean, just, just not only for that, not only for, again, you know, it's getting the grandmas to want to watch stuff. But again, that inspiration for people who have that culture, that aspect of them to, you know, inspire them to go back and look up that stuff, to connect to those cultures, to connect the, to those ideas. Like that, yeah. that to me is like, that's kind of like the finer points, the like the, the bigger goals of art is to like have it do those things so yeah Uh, that's awesome so like as a good example of that it happens like a little bit later into the film but like there's a line with one of the deals it's before um antonio's um you know ceremony and he's just like vamos 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 and that made me laugh so hard (laughs) because like the intonation just the intonation of how he said that i'm like this is literally my own uncle this is how my uncle talks. Like he do- he would say something like blah 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 and I'm like <laughs> that's great. I think that's funny. I uh the the aunt that I actually watched uh this with on Christmas looks exactly like Peppa is moody like Peppa. Oh my god. I thought it was so funny at the end of the movie like we were just staring at her cuz we were waiting for the aunt to be like and what did you think? And so she she was so confused. She's like, "Why do you think I'm hurt?" I'm like, "Do I need to hold a mirror?" <laughs> like, come on, it's, it's so very clearly. But, um, I, but I just think it's really great that they, again, that we're not just doing this Hispanic equals brown nonsense. Mm-hmm. That that we are going past that. We're seeing past that. That 
you know, when you have the global mix of just people in general, you're going to have, and this was always one of the, the dumber poses I've had is the whole like, Julieta must be from a different dad. It's like, no guys, yeah. like if you, if you know at least one Hispanic family, like I'm not even going to give you the credit of knowing multiple Hispanic people. No, if you know at least one Hispanic person, chances are in that own person's family, they have a ginger who is siblings <laughs> with someone darker than, like, than, yeah. So it's just, yeah, I'm just really glad that we're moving into a better, more accurate. Because it's, it's yes. not even like, oh, hey, this is for, for the values. It's No, it's literally just this is accurate. This is what people look like. It's like this is our culture. These are the different backgrounds and like inclusion that represents it. And it's yeah. it's 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 great. I'm happy that like you know, Encanto's just like the be the beginning of this and I'm hoping that we just see more like um black Latino representation because that is that that means a lot to me. I, I love it and it's you know finally like getting more recognized and appreciated um at least on a grander scale because it's such a beautiful culture there's so many unique things about about it yeah and then that's that's also to like I'm, I'm hoping everyone is you know putting on their 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 big their big undergarments on when we're having this talk here when like we say stuff that like hispanic culture is not a monolith mm -hmm. there's not yep. one like even within like us discussing this like my background is more uh, in line with puerto rican culture like that's more of my background mm -hmm. um and so that's not going to be a one-to-one -one with any other like hispanic-based culture not even on the own island it's a tiny heckin island and you're going to get at least seven different groups so i mean just just to also have that but again it's, it's always good to then to show that diversity then and like my my background is from peru like um my mom has Afro-Latino roots in her family, and my dad has Incan roots and indigenous roots in his family. Like, Latino culture encompasses so many things. It's, it's, it's wild. It's incredible. So much diversity. <laughs> like, like it, it's honestly a daunting task. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the absolute balls on, <laughs> on Mr. Miranda to be like, <laughs> I want to make a movie about Hispanic culture. It's like, whoa, those are two really huge words. Yep. Uh, but hey, I I think he pulled it off. I think I think this did it splendidly. Um, so you had the first couple there, lovely couple, fun couple. They're so loving, mm -hmm. and I think we'll get to that later. But I just love how even though we're dealing with like a very toxic family, that that all these characters love each other so much. Like no one inherently hates anyone. There's just very bad misunderstandings. Yep. But no, you have Peppa and and Felix. And then you have their three kids. So, and we'll just go probably on their order. So you have Dolores, who has Dolores. superhuman hearing and is going to be responsible for about 80% of the lore memes associated <laughs> with this movie. And it's fantastic. Yes. Homegirl is like a reservoir of Dark Souls-like terror. It's great. <laughs> she's probably my favorite. Yeah, she's great. Um, and, then, um, and then after her, we have her younger brother, uh, Camilo who can shapeshift and has the gift of being completely underutilized, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully we'll get either a sequel movie or we'll get like a, like a Lilo and stitch style, like TV show. Right. I think that would be fun. I think that'd be amazing. I think like they were talking about like, um, expanding Encanto into different, like, I mean, it was like having a sequel of Encanto of Sorts, whether that be like another movie or a TV show on Disney Plus or I don't know, something else. Like they are in the talks of expanding that universe. I think they mentioned that literally everything is on the table. It's not even yeah. like, oh, we're interested in this or this. It was literally like, we are interested in doing all the things. It could be anything. So it's like, all right, cool. <laughs> like, like we said, the mouse wants his, the mouse is going to mouse. And the mouse is going to mouse for some dollaronis, and this movie made him some dollarinos, and he's going to go hard for those. And then the youngest is Antonio. Uh, mm. He is getting his gift. His gift ceremony is is 
the first plot point of the movie, yep. I guess. Because we had the flashback, and we had Abuela talking to young Mirabel. And she's like, oh, you're going to get your gift today, girl. And you, you get all this tension. She goes for the reaching, and you get the title. And then that's when you get Mirabel much older. Uh, and that's when we get, you know, Casita uh, introduced as well, which fight me, but Casita is best girl in this movie. <laughs> like, you know, yes. we have a whole family. <laughs> yes. But I'm staking my claim here that I am team Casita through and through. Casita is literally, and I mean literally, the foundation of that family. Like, in the literal sense, <laughs> the literal foundation, <laughs> the literal rock. That's so good. So, yeah, sorry. I know, like, we were going through the character list. And I was yeah. like, wait a minute. I missed the important character. So, hold up. Mm-hmm. There is a house, and she's magical. But, so, Casita, and then uh, Peppa's family. Yeah. And then you have Julieta's family. So, Julieta is Mirabel's mom. So, this is Mirabel's family, her side of the family. So, Julieta married uh, Agustin. And so that's her dad. And he's a pretty cool Disney dad. Like, I, props for Mirabel. She gets to keep both her parents. Yeah. Like, none of the other Disney gals, all the other Disney gals would kill for that. I know they would. <laughs> they but, either, like, drown the parents. I mean, they either drown or one of them, you know, dies. And then biggest plot twist, and it's also a little bit obscure within the movie itself. I think they do this on purpose. I, I, I don't know if it's a conspiracy theory or not, mm-hmm. but I think they do this on purpose. But of of uh, Mirabel's sisters, so the oldest is Isabella, and then the middle sibling is Luisa, and then the youngest is Mirabel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know this is big because... Uh, with Luisa, we have her song, Surface Pressure, later on, that I think it crushed just about every oldest child in existence because they thought that song was playing for their soul. <laughs> when yeah, like, in actuality, she she's singing the middle child blues. Yeah. It's funny because, like, um, one of my friends used that comparison to get my roommate to watch Encanto because he was like well you're an older sibling and you take care of like all all of your siblings so I figured you'd relate to it and she's like no I'm not gonna watch Encanto and then afterwards she's crying because she's like oh my god I read to Lisa oh my god <laughs> you know what they say about Encanto the only people who don't like it haven't watched, watched it, it. Oh. <laughs> god but yeah, because it's a little iffy, but I mean, it works either way, because cause being a middle child is still being an elder child. There's still someone younger than you that you have to watch out for. Don't I know it. But... I'm a middle child. Oh, sandwiched... are you? Yeah, I'm sandwiched in between two brothers. Oh, no! Yeah, I'm the only girl <laughs> in my family. Because first it was my older brother, and then three years later it was me, and then three years after that was my little brother. So I so, yeah. am the oldest of six. Oh, gosh. Yeah. It started, I was actually the oldest of three. I'm a, a bit older than my sister, so mm-hmm. I helped raise them. So, you know, I wasn't just elder sibling. I was part-time step-parent. And then uh, then my parents did a whole Brady Bunch thing, and I got three step-siblings, and they were all still younger than me. And it's like, well, damn. So, so yeah, no, I <laughs> when, when I heard the, the lyrics for, for Surface Pressure, you know, I got the... I got the heartstring pull on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a good bop. It's a good jam. That's a great song. But... My kids, my students love that song. Cause I'll always sing it. We're gonna, mm-hmm. we're gonna get to this. It's a good song, yeah. but what else can I do? Is the better song, and we'll get to that. <laughs> um, we'll get to that. So yeah, so so family. Anyway, the la, la familia madrigal, the family. They all get introduced. They all got powers. They all help the town. The abuela emphasizes the whole, like, oh, not only are do y'all need to be good little shits, but y'all need to be helpful. You need to be resourceful. <laughs> you need to have purpose within the community, which, you know, surface level sounds good. Like, it's kind of the whole speech I'm sure most, like, parents have tried to instill. But, oh, boy, howdy, does it go south and toxic in this Disney fun ride. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I did like how, it, right at the end of the song, little detail, uh, so... Encanto had kind of like an art book released as well, which is fun yeah. because it's like a, it's like when it's like when the Final Fantasy games get an Ultimania release. It's just a book of all of the questions and all of the concept art you had while playing the game. <laughs> I like how Encanto has like this same thing where it's like all of the concept art and it's some really good stuff. 
Uh, like you kind of get a different layer of some of the characters, uh, like, like Dolores. You, you, well, she has some cool stuff that I liked that didn't make it into the final movie. But um, there's a scene or there's an art in the book of Mirabel with her having an accordion. Mm -hmm. I think it was probably going to end up being more of a thing that maybe the, the, the family Madrigal were going to be musicians or be more like outwardly musically inclined. I mean, we have it still in the movie. I mean, her dad still plays the piano. They still have music play yeah. during the party. But I, I took that more as just typical hispanic family like you know you're not not gonna have someone that can play music at the drop of a dead like you need to have that that's survival um mm -hmm. but at the end of the family song they give her that uh, accordion and there's some art with her playing the accordion so i think that was maybe like her intended like instrument at first um but they kind of turn it into a gag where instead it's because all the kids are asking what her gift is because she's going through and telling everyone everyone else's gift because she's so darn proud of her family she loves them <laughs> and her, they do the whole gag where she don't have a gift and <laughs> oh my god everyone is super rude about it yeah oh like, my god it is that was when i knew we were having true hispanic representation was when every family member just dunks on Mirabelle and gives no fucks about her feelings <laughs> or her emotions. Yep. It's just straight up like, hey, no gifty. Are you ready for the gift night for your cousin to get a gift? Oh, wait, <laughs> probably not because he ain't had no gift. I it's felt like, whoa. I felt that. I feel that so strongly with the family dunking on you because like not to tangent a bit, but like um, talking about <laughs> Hispanic family experiences. So um, one Please. Christmas, like 10 or 10 years ago, um, Run away! Hold on. Una Navidad. <laughs> Una Navidad. Una Navidad. Después. Después de diez años. Um, yeah. So, um, one year, my older brother got me a Christmas CD because he heard that I liked Christmas music, and that's all he got me for Christmas. And Aww. me being a bratty... Did he get you the Pokemon Christmas CD? No, it was a regular, like, generic Christmas <gasps> CD. So, like, me being a bratty 12-year-old at the time, I was basically like, what the fuck is this? I hate this. So every Christmas, and it happens every year, it happened last month, but every Christmas going forward, they will be like, oh, Caro, so what do you want for Christmas this year? A Christmas CD? I found a good one on Amazon. What do you think about this? And I'm just like... Damn, I was twelve. Damn. Why are you still dunking on me? <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Ma. That's like okay. So there was one year super tangent. We're going on this. We're writing yes. this. I one year for Christmas, my father got me an empty water bottle labeled O'Hare Air because what? you know we had just watched the Lorax movie so many times. Mm hmm. Oh my god. That's it. That, that was that, it? That's the punchline. The punchline is my sad <laughs> Christmas experience. That's it. Oh my gosh. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Talking about horrible Christmas <laughs> gifts here. Fun times. So that's what I'm saying. Encanto was the truest of representation. Like, it doesn't get much better than that. Like, that, that's like you say, that is the true hint thing. Yep. That is, that's, <laughs> it's all concentrated. <laughs> but yeah, so, so the family's throwing a party, of course, throwing a fiesta. The whole town's invited because Antonio's going to get his gift. And I think they did a really cool thing with just, you know, having his relationship with Mirabel, having them be adorable together, showing that, you know, like she loves her family, like for the people. She mm -hmm. doesn't, she doesn't give two fucks about how much Luisa can lift. Like she doesn't care uh, who Camilo can turn into. Like she just is literally just living with her family. Like she just likes them. It, it's like to her, the powers are like this icing where it's like, oh man, my family and they have superpowers. But I mean, we've all seen Sky High. That's another thing I wanted to get into that this movie is just Sky High again. Oh my God. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but we have the whole thing where Antonio gets his gift. It's He's a little nervous, but he gets it. He can talk to animals, which... I think it's Nito Speedo that uh, all of uh, Peppa's family. So they're actually color coordinated, and I didn't even notice it until I saw like some of the the designer notes. Uh, Peppa's family are more on the brighter side of colors, a lot more golds, yellows, reds, versus Juli Julieta's family uh, tend to be more on greens, purples, blues, um, cooler color right. sides. So I thought that was super neat. Um, 
But I did like how on Peppa's side, uh, all of them have means of either like deception or like communication. <laughs> like Dolores being able to hear everything, yeah. Camilo being able to be anyone, and then Antonio being able to speak, but speaking to the animals. So I think it's kind of a neat thing that there's all a sort of interaction involved in all of their powers. They're not really powers that they can use like themselves yeah. or like by themselves. It's something that involves you interacting with someone it's else it's very situational versus... is what you're trying to say yeah yeah exactly and you kind of like get that like from peppa's f- power being you know this weather manipulation because it's not even weather control i mean i know it's like a picky thing but damn it i've read x-men okay there's a <laughs> difference there's a fucking difference she's not con- she's not controlling it she- she's just changing it based on something that's most of the time completely out of her control um but Antonio gets his gift, he gets the animal, he can speak with them, and he gets, like, his room. So that's the whole thing that every car- every family member that has a power has a room. And that's why Mirabella has to fucking live in the nursery, even though there's several scenes of the family building houses for other people. Yeah. Like, it's, it's insanity just, like... Like, the, that was probably the thing that got, caught me off guard the first time watching Encanto was just kind of how bad she was being treated. Like, it was very, like, Madeline, like, Pollyanna, like, oh, let's knock this girl down even harder than than we thought. Like, yeah. let's make her as bad as we, like, it felt bad for bad sake, like, kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but then once I saw, once I, you know, you see the end of the movie and you know, you know, that the happy ending, like it makes it more tolerable. But on that first watch, I was a bit put off by just how much everyone was leaving her out. Yeah. Um, but, but it does culminate again with, um, as part of the celebrations, they, they, they take a family photo <laughs> without <laughs> her. her. Yeah. And that's where I lost it. Cause that's where I would have been like, let my magical family take a photo without me. That candle would have been dunked in a sink. That candle would have been in the toilet. <laughs> and just, just like, roll the no. credits. Just roll the credits after you throw the candle. That's it. <laughs> like, I don't mind if you don't like me. I don't mind if you think I'm an embarrassment to the family. I don't care if every time I come out of my room, you say, oh, hey, he's out of his dungeon. Like, I get it. But don't be taking no family photo without me. And, like, I'll discuss this more when we eventually get to, like, uh, you know, Bruno. But, like, um... The idea of being, like, left out and the idea of being, like, a black sheep of sorts in your family, especially in Hispanic culture, was something that, like, I resonated with. It didn't help either that I was, like, the only girl in my immediate family, aside from my mom. So, yeah. (laughs) Oh, wow. That's kind of interesting, because I had the opposite. I was always living in a house of women. I was always the only guy. Huh. Wow. Anywho. (laughs) So, 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 we, we have the photo. Um, Mirabelle has her song, which, which is, uh, so Waiting on a Miracle is pretty good. I just haven't seen it get, like, memed to hell and back like the other ones. I think the other ones just kind of work better on, like, online formats or, like, snippets and stuff. But Waiting on a Miracle is pretty good. Um, you know, it's your typical, I would go the distance. It, it's, it's the I want song, yeah. I think. It's the I, think I that's want what they this. Usually refer to. What do you want in your life? She and she says it quite clearly. She wants to move the mountains. She wants to heal what was broke. She wants to she wants to do all the things. She wants to make her family proud. She says it several times in the movie. Mm-hmm. She's very quite clear. <laughs> um, and but that's also when she has the whole. I guess it's a premonition. I know it's kind of meant to be like a an ambiguous like what really is it kind of goes with that whole magical realism like the fact that you know if the powers are just common everyday things, sort of makes sense that like. A, a vision hallucination type thing because it's not the same as as a gift it's not a, a gift vision it's more yeah i don't like i said like it's it's ambiguous what happens but you know mirabelle sees the cracks she sees the candle she sees the miracle in danger it's more of a symbol than like oh this is happening and so she's paranoid and she tries to like alert the whole family but it backfires and the family thinks that she's just doing it say with me folks for the attention Uh but she's not and so she's on a mission because it it, it, it's also a little weird too where you know she sees the danger that that the miracle is in and she's just so ready to be like i'm gonna save it i'm gonna i'm gonna 
be the one to make it right. I don't know if it's meant to be like you're supposed to assume that she thinks she's earning a gift in doing so, but I don't know. I just think it's really weird that like to be left out of the system. And again, when they took the photo without, yeah, you know, like, even if you weren't gonna be like, oh, I'm putting the candle out to be so intently like I this will sa- I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna be in charge of it. it. It is a bit much, but I know there's like theories kind of in the favor of um. Kind of the, the 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 concept of like a candle holder within the family. Um, mm-hmm. I know that's just a, a head canon. It's just a theory. Yada yada. But it, there's still there are still members. There are still characters in this movie that are part of the family that don't have powers that have very close relationships to the candle. It's not just the main character. There's also abuela. So I mean, yep. There's things which I, I I thought that was one of the better memes too is that where Mita Bell realizes that Abuela is so hard on her all the time yeah. and she doesn't have a gift. But wait a minute, Abuela doesn't have a gift. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like there's that immigrant yeah. kid experience of your parents didn't do it either, but they want better for you, so you have to do better than them. It's like it's not good. Good enough is not good enough. You gotta do better than them. Yeah, that's a my that's so. my. I love my mom. I love my dad, but they. <laughs> they, they did the same this is the crushing too. weight of expectations it's the weight of expectations mm. fun <laughs> that's what this whole movie's about isn't it yep. again relate to this so hard <laughs> <laughs> crushing weight of expectation sounds like the, the next song because <laughs> <laughs> that is what happens so basically she tries to figure out what the fuck's going on you have a cool like breakfast scene where she tries to corner Dolores, but she gets Camilo. Then she gets Dolores. And so real quick, I know everyone talks about like fan rooms. Like, oh, we don't get to see Luis's room. We don't get to see Dolores's room. Spoilers, we don't get to see them. But I see a lot of people that are like, oh, Dolores's room is probably like soundproof or it's like something like that. But like you have this line here where she says she heard Luis's eye twitching all night. So unfortunately, her room is not soundproof, Gosh. and she ha- it, it, it must suck that she can even hear eye twitches all night. Um, but again, I like how this now this ties into like the dark lore of Encanto is what does Dolores know, and what has Dolores been doing for the last couple of years? But um, this is where you get that first inkling of it, yeah. where she mentions she can hear everyone else in her room, even throughout the night. So. Mirabel goes to Luisa, and Luisa cracks, and she exposes her insecurities. <gasps> Whoa! And it, it became a pop song sensation. <laughs> that sound- Complete with dancing donkeys that sounds very, and a Titanic reference. That sounds very in tune with the pop music industry. Putting your pain into music, and then it's being capitalized for money. <laughs> I mean, we're monetizing our hobbies already. The, it might as well make a nickel off of your pain. <laughs> Just a nickel. Jeez. Well, that's only if uh, your pain gets a thousand views. Otherwise, you're only going to get fractions of a penny. Like 0.0001 cents. Cool. Cool, cool. So, so uh, smash that subscribe yeah, button. Yeah, that's right. Smash that subscribe button. <laughs> like. But do not dislike. Actually, if you can dislike. We just won't know that you did because YouTube removed the dislike we- bar. <laughs> You might as well do it since we're not going to know anyway, so who cares? If all of you are mad that we spoke Spanish in this video, dislike! It's okay! <laughs> Go ahead! If you, didn't under- <laughs> if you didn't understand what we said when we were talking Spanish, hit that dislike button. <laughs> Capiche? Go study Spanish is the lesson here. I mean, globally, it's the fourth most commonly spoken language yeah it's actually ahead of english yeah because i think the other ones that was always one of my fun facts i think the other ones chinese definitely right chinese is one of the most yeah so you have mandarin yeah mandarin mandarin Mandarin. hindi Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh mandarin hindi i always forget what number three is and then yeah and then after that is spanish and then english wow so yeah right take that english good shit (laughs) take that colonizer oh my gosh took the words out of my mouth <laughs> i was really good i was literally gonna say colonist surface pressures is pretty cool um it's catchy the drip 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 the tick 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 and it, it's it, it's a banger it's a bop it's the moment um i dig the dancing donkeys but i know for some reason some people got like mad at dancing donkeys, why i don't know some people just don't like fun i think some people have just never spent enough time with their burros and that is sad um 
But yeah, yeah, the cool moment. Then in the song too's got its nice fun dark moments where it's like give her the family burden and not worry if we couldn't handle it ourselves. It's like, damn. Mm-hmm. Like Luisa, my girl. But also she is being asked to carry donkeys around town that we honestly have no idea why she even needs to carry said donkeys. So like she kind of needs that help. <laughs> <laughs> but so so and it's kind of funny. I like how the plot sort of turns into this just talk to this character, get next location, talk to next person, get next location. But Luisa points Mita Bell to Bruno's tower. Yep. Um because Luisa felt weak, her powers went away, which I thought was going to cuz you see that in like the trailers and yeah. stuff. I thought there was going to be more of like the family really unraveling from like losing their yeah. powers. But we don't really get like a lot of that. It gets a little chaotic for like a scene or two, but we don't really get it's mostly through Luisa that we see like the characters like have this identity crisis of like, "Oh no, if I don't have power, then who am I?" And I thought that was going to maybe be more of like for their character to kind of explore and give them that lesson. But you don't really get that as much. It's really heavily focused on, you know, Mita Bell's journey, what she discovers and what she like her effect through the family. Yep. That's kind of also what you get in the video is that she is her own force and effect. Like that's kind of the whole thing of the yeah. movie is that she is important, not because of anything, but just by being herself, by just being her in situations around the people she loves that's it has its own effect it's like its own gift in itself without the um (gasps) razzle dazzle you know sparkly magical powers you know without a fucking door (laughs) it's like maybe your real power was in your heart all along (laughs) like we get it we know the one piece was the friends we made all along (laughs) i've accepted that years ago but you got to give it to us eventually. You just like I we're ready. We know it was the friends all. Along. I I just give it to I us. I haven't read a like of one piece, but I know that like the one piece is probably going to be something really small. <laughs> <laughs> or like I said, really big. We don't know. We just all, I just like to always remind people that a couple months back, they were time traveling. So technically, they were further away from their original goal of the one piece than ever before. <laughs> so like we'll have to see how it comes to an end but that's a series for another discussion <laughs> so she goes to bruno's room and I, I i like the design on bruno's door yeah it's a little worn down it's not the same as the other doors because all the other doors are neat and cool other than the thing that people have pointed out that why are their doors like the age of them like currently like the adults doors have them as adults the kids doors have them as yeah. kids and like i, I i'm sure like the the simple you know Occam's razor cut it keep it simple is just you know the doors age with them it's a magic house like I'm sure it can replace doors very easily good casita casita's so good we get so many great great moments uh, we get casitas uh, serving everybody uh, cafe <laughs> because it's, it's and you cool. know how much of course we love our coffee Mm-mm. I've I've never gone a day without at least five cups of coffee yeah. <laughs> it's it's not an addiction it's cultural it is very cultural it's uh, why like earlier in the movie where there's that coffee line i laughed so much oh my gosh yeah <laughs> same in peru oh, the small child yeah it's the same thing in peru we can't live <laughs> with small- our coffee either no yeah i like that um i like the the, the, the gags were like casita can't decorate itself it's like the hell i can't <laughs> uh, you have that and just just some of the great animations of like how it's able to like hold people and then how it's able to like kick Mita Bell's shoes and stuff like I I dig Casita just in terms of the animation and then in terms of just kind of what it serves in the story as well because uh I think there's more of like a a picture book um that that the that the story is also based off of um and in the picture book uh Casita the 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 house also bullies Mita Bell yeah which I think which I'm really glad they didn't go with because that would have taken it one step too far. Because I feel like, again, it was already kind of awkward just how mean the family themselves were. But it also makes sense. You know, right. like when you have magic powers, power goes to your head, whatever. Like, the house being her one true friend is like, I feel is like is so needed. Because, you know, it, it gives her that grounding. It gives her that friend there. It gives her, I mean, it also helps when later in the movie we have to be emotional for a house but yeah <laughs> it works and then like just also because like having the house bully her as well it's like well yeah you're just creating a villain origin story here so 
It's like that generational trauma gets worse. <laughs> the intergenerational trauma is literally so intergenerational, it's structural. <laughs> Oof. Ouch. No Damn. thank you. But it, it, I, I do like that as one good change from, you know, source material to adaptation is that, you know, Casita is turned into this purely sympathetic entity. And I, I think it works. Like I said, it, 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 it's my favorite character in the whole fucking movie. Like, the house is true. And the fact that the house, like, treats Midabel, like, well is also kind of in the, in the favor of, like, the movie's plot. Because it, it kind of, like, shows that, like, she doesn't deserve to be treated that way. That if even the house can treat her like any other family member, then, you know, the, the family member should follow in tow. Yeah. Uh, so I think it, I, I think it makes it more complicated. It makes it work better as a symbol as opposed to, haha, everyone hates me to bell with no gift. Even the floors don't like her. I feel like that would have just been, ugh. Yeah. And I don't think it, I would have latched too well onto that, but, but Casita also has a fucking tower of sand. Yeah. A damn tower of sand. <laughs> Casita has everything. It, it has everything. Um, but yeah, so Mita Bell tries to go into Bruno's tower. It's very tall. There's a lot of sand. It's it's a cool like imagery. I know it's heavily inspired by a lot of the South American, Central American like cave structures. Um, a lot of those underground structures, which is super cool because a lot of those are fucking gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, but then she makes it to his room. She's able to find some shards of glass, which I do like. Is kind of the comparison there that you see is that uh. Uh, you know, glass is from sand. Right. So if his power involves making glass, he's going to need a shit ton of sand. So I thought little things like that were kind of cool. And then you know the 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 equivalent of uh being sand sand in the hourglass as well. Right. So I think that's super cool. But she goes in the room. It crumbles and fumbles apart. It I don't know. This kind of gives you like the whole adventure scene. It's very Indiana Jonesy. Even though she's literally, like, in her own house. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, like, she's, like, it's, like, this grand adventure, but then, like, if you're looking from the outside, looking in, it's just casa. It's just la casita. <laughs> she travels the furthest when she's running away. <laughs> like, that's when she literally yep. travels the furthest in terms of distance. Um, like, when you really think about yeah, it, most of this movie is, like, contained in the village. <laughs> It'll really, like, go on this grand, 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 like, adventure, you know, that you see with, like, other Disney films. Mm-hmm. It's, like, all within that, you know, area. And I think that's kind of, you know, being being based on, on Macondo. Yeah. Uh, in, in the book, it's it's always still from on there. You're just getting it in different time periods as well. So it, in the book, Macondo kind of does a whole casita type thing where, you know, the town itself is a character. The town itself has its own identity and changes throughout the years, uh, depending on what time period of what family member is being written about. So like, and that's why I say, I kind of, I really do like what Encanto does where it's not one-to-one, but you kind of get the, the similar like resizing. So instead of seven generations of Buena Vidas, you get, you know, three generations you get grandma parents cousins and it, it just kind of simplifies and instead of everything happening in macondo you just kind of get what's happening in casita what's happening yep. in one house the da- i think the downscale really works in the movie's favor and i think it was done pretty successfully but she, she she gets the vision and kind of the big plot after you know antonio had his gift ceremony immediately the next order of business for the family is working on isabella's engagement yeah which is very red flaggy and i think they did that on purpose as well i think cuz when kind of some of the theories that have popped up for that as well i think are like okay that i i, I kind of got to agree with that but yeah they, they immediately after antonio's party when they when uh mirabella's you know, trying to figure out what was happening with the vision or whether the vision was even true is when they bring in that Isabella is getting engaged to to Mariano. And we don't know much about him. I'm just on the assumption that he's just the prettiest boy in town. Like, yeah, is, is that kind of all we really get? It's a typical Disney suitor. He's a suitor. I mean, thankfully, no spoilers. He does not turn bad in no. the last 10 minutes. <laughs> nope. He does not. He does not tell... Tell Isabella that it's a shame no one loves you. <laughs> what the fuck does that even mean? God. What are you talking about? <laughs> but, um, so that's when the family is getting ready for their next party. 
because our culture <laughs> got to get ready for the next party. Um, so Mita Bell's trying to figure out what was hap- why Bruno even disappeared. What was the the tea about that? What was the drama? Why is he even hecking gone? <laughs> um, and and in in the art book, there, there's a missing song where they're showing uh, how everyone's getting ready for for the engagement party. They had a song with Mita Bell. Uh, Felix and Augustine. Uh, so basically the three non-powered members of the family. And it was kind of them cleaning and just washing the house, washing casita. And I thought that like an idea, it sounds really great. Yeah. Because that way you would give like some family members that sympathetic twist. Like Mirabel is at least close with her uncles because they, they too have no powers. And so, you know, their job would obviously be like the non-power stuff of cleaning the house. But, you know, Casita being lovable would, you know, it works. It, that Casita would, it wouldn't care who's cleaning it. Casita likes the non-powered members. It, it loves everyone. So um, I don't know if there was information specifically on what their song would have been about, but just the whole concept of like there would have been a scene in which Mita Bell did helped get ready with her uncles. It's kind of I kind of like that idea, and I'm sure they'll probably use that for you know the extended Encanto universe. But um, you know, with, with with the party coming up. She goes to her aunt and uncle. She goes to Peppa, and she's like, yep. "All right, it's time. Why? Why don't you, we? We we learn that we don't talk about Bruno, but Jesus Christ, are we fully prepared to sing about him millions upon millions of times? Uh, so, what do you think of we don't talk about Bruno? It is literally the most awful Disney song." ever in existence Awful. no i hate it it's no, gross throw it in the it garbage is nasty give me let it go offensive every say less give me every single time give me let it go give me colors of the wind give me um <laughs> that one song from tangled that i can't remember hmm <laughs> give me immortal <laughs> give me immortal that, that that time they brought fallout boy in to do a disney God. song and just no one remembers but that's okay yeah. I remember. I will always remember. Good job. <laughs> but uh, it's like I, I'd say bring in Shakita, but that's a little too on the nose because she's also Colombian. Yeah, but she also she already did a Disney yeah, song. She was in Zootopia. She did the Zootopia song. Mm-hmm. I like that one yeah. too. That one's that one's a guilty pleasure, but the the the, the Shakita Zootopia song is a bop and a banger. Well, Shakira's a banger and the bop either way. But in all seriousness. <laughs> um, I love We Don't Talk About Bruno. I sing it a lot. I sing it when I'm filing. I sing it when I'm taking the bus home. I sing it when I'm eating. I sing it a lot. <laughs> it's a great song. It's like green eggs and ham. Yeah. <laughs> I will sing it nice. here or there. I will sing it everywhere. I do the same. I, I think it is a fantastic song. I think it's a great musical song. Mm-hmm. Just because I think there's a lot of really good like storytelling yeah. in this song. Like you, you get so 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 the the song starts off um, because so far within the the movie each song's kind of been used as a revelation you know waiting on a miracle is Mita Bell revealing what she wants um, surface pressure is Luisa revealing her insecurities so like we don't talk about Bruno is we'll we'll get to whose revelation I feel this song is about but it's broken up into at least different parts. Uh, mostly on Peppa's side of the family, which I think is kind of neat. Um, kind of gives at least the cohesion to the song that it's this whole family basically dogpiling on D- Theo Bruno. Mm-hmm. Because I, 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 I like the, the, the conversation some people are having where it's like, Camilo is too young to know anything about Bruno. How does he know these things about Bruno? It's like, because his family's talking mad shit. It's like, yeah, he doesn't know anything firsthand, but that doesn't matter when literally everyone in his family has a story and a beef to pick with him. Like, he's going to have a beef. He inherited that beef. Mm -hmm. But I I do like how it starts with Peppa claiming that he ruined her wedding day when she's the one that has the the weather controlling powers. I'm just I'm just saying. Like, Bruno has no say over whether a hurricane comes or not. <laughs> and I know that's sort of, like, the funny twist, the, the like, the, the 
nuance of the song of Bruno's character is that you know people aren't seeing past yeah. that he said it it happened he did it it's, it's like okay. they don't understand how fate and inevitability work mm-hmm. I guess yeah which is weird because fate is a big thing in the book sorry just because because there's a lot of like history repeaty things so it, I think it's funny that like the big banger song in this movie is about people they're like i don't understand <laughs> cause and effect it's like yes it, it's a thing it happens it's basic common uh, sense you have, you have on, the wedding uh you have dolores's part which is great that's so this is where i feel um this song is mostly dolores's reveal within like the plot yeah. we get a little bit of isabella too but this like if you were to assign songs based on who like reveals the most of their character within said song you know obviously you know luisa being surface pressure Mm -hmm. dolores is actually the one that for we don't talk about bruno that like the most gets revealed. yeah i agree she she talks about it in other things but this is her reveal song this is where we find out what's not really like troubling her but we find out like what's her character like twist like what's let's let the dealio go and it, i think it's funny too because it's not just her straight up being like i am burdened by hearing my uncle yeah. <laughs> but it's instead it's a whole deal of saying that it's like she can hear him she associates him with sand that she hears mumbling and fumbling and um uh, I, I love the fact that she's singing much more quietly because yeah. she, she she knows someone might be listening Um, It's so unique. Like, I I also read that they wanted her to sing higher, but she, but she was able to like, um, you know, pass off the um, idea to sing lower because not only like it fits her character better, but it also fits like the whole like, shh, I don't want to figure anything, you know? Yes. And, and I, I, they're not 100% consistent on Mm -hmm. it, but like 90% of the time, I think it's really cool that they give Dolores these like alternative animations like anytime people are clapping she's uh she's usually clapping the tips of her fingers yeah. <laughs> uh whenever there's fireworks she's covering her ears uh so so for the most part like there's a huge acknowledgement that she has always on sonar hearing that she just kind of has to manually dampen to to make it like work for her yeah um so i think that's super cool i like how they do that in that song they do it with her singing um there there's a uh, certain someone dancing in the background in her part as well which i think is fantastic again one of the benefits of watching this movie multiple times mm-hmm. but i did want to because i had, had brought it up a, a little bit earlier but in dolores's concept art uh they have her drawn a bit more manically like she looks a lot more not crazy but like perturbed like you can definitely tell that this is someone who is probably hearing everything at the same time and can't block it out like her eyes are all kind of like big like she seems really like not there yeah um and like they gave her like messy hair again kind of makes it seems like she's probably just really overwhelmed by everything um but they also do a lot of drawings of her with a guitar as well so really i'm sure like they probably had it tied in that like maybe due to her like amazing hearing that she was going to be musically inclined or like maybe had like perfect pitch or something because again they probably had it planned for the whole family to be musical they probably just had her maybe be like a more musical person because of her being having a a sound related power right um i did also see and this is probably like just a rumor but i did see that uh it's also possible that her power and julieta's the healing cooking that their powers may have been switched uh just because dolores's name uh a part of it is dolor which is pain in spanish oh uh, i didn't even think of that that's really cool so there could have been this thing where Dolores took care of pain and the mother, you know, being a mom, could hear everything that her kids were saying. So again, like it still works, but I do like what instead they did here of the, you know, the the nosy cousin that's in everyone's drama and knows everyone's business. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's one, a thousand times more accurate and two is, is a lot more fun. But so, so you have her verse again a tragically underused vocal yeah. for one verse uh and then you have camilo's uh the fucking iconic seven foot frame verse <laughs> like I, I i i i can't imagine how it must be how it must be to be surrounded by a person under the age of five right now in, in this time yeah in, in this world right now like it must 
be nonstop seven foot frame rats along his back. Seven foot I mean, frame <laughs> and the lungs back. You know, I hear that every day. Literally every day. I heard it, it today. Actually, stop. it never ends. It just keeps going. It's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> I contribute <laughs> to it. It's so catchy too. It's so catchy. Like it. You gotta give. You gotta give the man credit. Like you may, he, whether you like hearing the rapping or not, the man is catchy. The man knows lyrics that are just in your brain and will never leave. Okay, Mr. Mouse, you win this round. <laughs> Here is my wallet. But I do like the Ahola, uh, the ooky spooky boogeyman angle that they give, you know, his part of the uh, of the song, because this is, again, what I mean by by uh, Lin-Manuel's style is that he each of these verses is like a part. It's like a Lego. He, he, he sets up all these pieces because he's getting them ready to just stack them all on top of each other and just put them all together. So I think it's really cool how he sets them up there. Uh, he has the interlude with all the townsfolk, which I think is so fun. The whole, like, he said my fish was going to die. He said I was going to be fat. He said all my hair was going to fall. It's like, people, these are inevitable things. Like, the man didn't even need to make his eyes glow to see half this shit. Like, come on. Mm-hmm. But but then you have, like, the Hamilton moment. Like, the, the moment that I feel is very, like, I'm sure they were like, we could do this exactly like if it was on a stage play. Like, you have the moment where all the town's people are in a circle. They put their hand up. And then Isabella descends on a flowery swing. And it's amazing. And she puts her entire Ancantussy into her verse. And it's it, it, it's good. It, it's the good stuff. But I, I do love how in this song of everyone singing about all of the all the misfortune that fell upon her, Isabella in her infinite perfection shows up. It's like, yeah, no, he told me shit was going to be righteous. <laughs> it's like, damn. Dang. <laughs> it's fun, too, because if you look at Mita Bell's face throughout that whole scene, she's not having it. Yeah. She's done. It's fun. <laughs> I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you have that. And then, yeah, and then again, then the the song, like, hard turns into the Dolores show, where she mentions that she was told that the man of her dreams would be wed to, would be betrothed to someone else. And all I can picture is this one meme I saw, where it's Dolores seeing her parents, Felix and Peppa, just being a loving, caring couple. Yeah. And just wanting that for herself, going to her tío, being like... So what's my love life going to be like? And he has to tell her <laughs> about the whole being betrothed to another. It's like, damn, Dio Bruno. You probably broke that little five-year-old. She she didn't recover. Damn. Uh, so you have that. I, I love yeah. Isabella's uh, I want not a sound out of you, sister. Like, yeah. damn, shut that down. She's like, you are not fucking up my engagement. I am getting married and you are not ruining this. <laughs> uh Mirabelle needs to know about that Bruno and then mm-hmm. yeah and then you basically have the payoff of the song you have you know he sets up each verse each piece and then in true Manuel style is like all right everyone do your part at the same time go <laughs> which is Manuel. fantastic first couple times it's a little disorienting but then you're like oh no they're just singing what they just sang again layered on top of each other and it works amazingly it's so good the the build up too of uh uh, Isabella, your boyfriend's here. The tone shift that that line does. Is so good. <laughs> I just remember that. <laughs> it's just such a good song. Like each part of the song is really good. Um, but probably my favorite is again at the end when everyone is singing their verses again. Uh, there's a change, and it's kind of hard to hear the first couple times. Like it took me, it took me to hearing the song a couple times to hear it, and then I had to have it confirmed by watching the video that has the lyrics to like yeah. really get it. Because um, for a while I was hearing at the end, um, Dolores sings her verse of, "He told me the the love of my life would be betrothed to another." So, and then rather than just saying that, and I can hear him now, she changes it to, and I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Like, it, it's it's horrifying just hearing her sing, and I'm fine, over and over and over. Because it's like, ooh, girl, I know not fine, and that's not fine. 
But and so at first I'm thinking like that's that's spooky like that's that's good shit that is like I I love some good musical storytelling but when I saw I when I saw the lyrics video I was shocked that she's not the only one who has a lyric change Isabella also sings that she's fine she's fine she's fine so they both are like not fine and so you know aside from just how catchy and like how yes every four-year-old is playing and singing <laughs> the song over and over again like despite all that i still feel like you know the composition of like we don't talk about bruno is so good it is like, very a- very very well done like um one of my it's one of the smaller aspects of the song but um one of my favorite lines when they're like we don't talk about Bruno, no, 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 no. Like, specifically with Bruno, it works two ways because Bruno's his name. But when you have no, 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 it's kind of like, it's like, no, 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 no. We don't talk about him. No. <laughs> it's so good. And and just, you know, yeah. T- t- again, that back to the realism. There is always Hispanic family beef mm-hmm. where it's like, I want to go over to my Theo's house. Like, we're not going. Like, your Theo's not going to be there. Like, but why is it? No, shut up. Stop talking about your Theo. Yep. Like, okay. <laughs> like, I, I don't know where he went. It's probably prison, but sucks he's not here. It's like, what's going on? <laughs> what's happening? Mom, come pick me up. I'm scared. But yeah, so that's where you kind of... So so would you agree or disagree that this is our villain song of the movie? If, is this our if, poor unfortunate souls? If you're talking about the... In the sense that of the, that family's viewpoint towards Bruno and the ostracization of him, um, I would say yes and no because obviously when we get you know when we get when we actually meet Bruno later in the movie and we get to know him more, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. But we'll get there. I, this is true because mm-hmm. I, I mean I, I will preference even with the context that we know that the true villain of this movie is trauma. Mm-hmm. We we like that's already like that's a step. Bruno is not the villain. No. Trauma is the villain. But is we don't talk about Bruno though still the villain song. Right. I would say up to that point, like, yes, because like also keep in mind that like when when I watched this movie like the first time through, I was like, there's no way Bruno's like the villain. And I always had that assumption. I never in got mind. that neither. I never, I never assumed Bruno was the the villain. I never assumed he was, like, evil or mastermind or anything. I was like, he must be ostracized in some way. Something weird must have happened, and you know know how Hispanic families are. Something about being the weirdo in the family. We're just more sympathetic to others around us. It's so weird. So it's like, to the the Masrigal family, they might as well consider him the villain. And in that case, you could classify it as a villain song. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I just wanted to know, just because I know just... And that's going to be a thing maybe we can talk about, too, when we get to the end of the movie yeah. as, well, as a whole. Is that that's kind of one of the more non-traditional things about this movie is sort of the, the cast structure in that we don't have a typical uh, antagonist. Nope. Or it's not – the antagonist is not a character. There's never really, so, like, and- a clear-cut, hey, this is the villain, they're bad, you have to defeat the evil – And it's all embedded in a character, which is what you typically see in Disney movies. But in this case, it's a little different. Yeah. Which it is super good because you know that there must have been meeting after meeting of Disney as X being like, but who's the bad guy? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're just having to bang their heads on the desk because like (laughs) they've already explained this five meetings ago. But this is a new guy. And he's like, but who's the bad guy? And they're like, there's no (laughs) bad guy. Uh, like that was the one thing I remember was uh, with this movie uh, being set being set in South America. Is that it's kind of similar to uh, the Emperor's New Groove. Yeah, being yeah. set in in ink in South America, and just the whole shenanigans of the sweat box with the Emperor's New Groove of how they <laughs> had their movie just about put together, and then some executives sat and watched it in a theater and were like, "Yeah, no, I don't like it," and they had to change the entire fucking yeah. movie. It's like, wow. So I just. So here's my thing is like whenever a Disney movie, movie comes out, I just always picture that it had to go through the uh, that exact same process of it had they had to have some exec sit in a tiny movie theater watch it and they had to be like yeah I like that or what was and you know they ask a million questions so I know they must have been asked like more times than they wanted to be asked about oh yeah but who who was the bad guy or who probably especially more during the pitch 
phase as opposed to once they had the movie because when you watch the movie it makes sense i'm sure like when they were trying to like explain the characters and the plot they kept having to go back to like but who's the bad guy which one of these is the bad guy it's like they're all the bad guy actually none of them are actually never mind (laughs) oh but we do get but the, the, the song does end with her like putting the the vision together and i do like the the aesthetic the style of his visions of how they're like a 3D in model, uh, like swizzle swizzle image for some of them. Yeah, uh, I do like the green glass. I do like. Uh, we'll see that green is the color associated with Bruno. I like how that's tied in with the whole bright colors for Peppa, cooler colors on Julieta and then Bruno, sort of in the middle there with green. Um, something I kind of also wanted to point out with that too is uh. The rims of Mirabelle's glasses are also green. So, I mean, not not to go, like, heavy ham color theory, but I think it is kind of cool. I think maybe, like, they tried to have green be more of a reflection of, like, truth. You know, kind possibly, of, yeah, that's how yeah. Mirabelle is able to see the truth of, like, her family. She she sees past, like, the gifts, similar to how Bruno's visions, his eyes glow green when he sees the future. She sees, like, the, the more effective present, I guess. So I thought that was, I think it was, again, like, a lot of the color theory in the movie is super spot on and super good. I know they did that on purpose. Like, again, I'm sure they had many meetings about it but you know i noticed it and i liked it and i just want to let them know that i did see it it's like you, they put so much detail into like this movie i know we've said it before but just like even like the smallest thing that you wouldn't think about like um they're able to um use here and i know i'm saying like i love this movie like 50 times but i really love this movie <laughs> Like everyone's clothes has symbols on it that are also related to them. Yep. Luisa's dress has like dumbbell weights on the cross stitch. Uh, Camilo has little chameleons, which I didn't notice at first, but his little uh, triangle diamond design, it's a little chameleon. No way. Um, Let me look it up. <laughs> yes. They're super cute. I love all of them. Uh, Julieta's got like Aww. little plant herb, mm-hmm. herb designs. Um, and so what makes it interesting is that Mirabelle on her dress, she has a bunch of them all sewn onto her. Again, kind of tying back to her being uh, more of a collective member of the family. Like, it's not just who she is, but, like, what her effect is on everyone else or that connection to everyone else. Which, again, like, it's, it's her gift is almost like that ability to connect to her family and to get them to reveal, like, those insecurities and those breaking points. Yep. But... But she doesn't know that. She says she just has this trippy vision that she's in and has the house cracking. So her dad finds out. And because more than one person in the house found out, Dolores found out. And Dolores is a sneaky bitch, all right? (laughs) She doesn't want to be in on the drama, but she wants to know 105% of what's going on in that drama. So you have the whole dinner scene. Mariano shows up. And ew, it's, it's... how did you feel about the dinner scene? Because I thought the dinner scene was pretty funny. Had had some awkward tension, but I think it it was a good fun moment. It hit the nail on the head regarding family awkwardness. Oh, sorry, my headset did a thing, but um, it, it hit the nail on the head regarding like family awkwardness dinner. Because I'm sure you've had those moments. I'm pretty sure you have. Oh. Whew. The, the the cousin stare down. I've done oh. the cousin stare down. I was, I've done the you you say one word and I will jump across this table. <laughs> like it's I, I've had that whole moment but I gotta I gotta question why Dolores wasn't able to keep a secret for that long like there is no way there is I don't buy it I feel like there's an inconsistency in characterization at this moment but that's neither here nor there right um, you have everyone at the table everyone gets set at the table I do want to point out when it was showed earlier everyone has their own plate everyone has their own uh, silverware within the family and it's very touching it's very sweet i think it's really cool that they like lots of meals together as a family that's not one of those stories where like oh the family's so busy it's very much like abuela has called you all to the table you have been summoned (laughs) right (laughs) um but everything goes to absolute shit dolores like spills spills the secret which causes everyone to freak out which includes isabella Bopping Mariano on the nose with a, I think it was a yucca, but yeah, <laughs> I like how everything just falls apart 
And I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel like the whole arranged marriage plot, like, as a whole, didn't work out. Because, like, I don't get how anyone could, one, think Bruno was a bad guy at the beginning. Or two, been like, oh, yeah, Mariano's a cool guy. Like, can't can't wait for this marriage to go down. <laughs> you think anyone was really but, down with, like, Mariano? Just okay. look at it. I don't know. <laughs> Something, I mean, you, ever just, you, could... you ever just feel like a character radiate like energy or something? I mean, he gives me the other guy energy. Yeah. He's not the main character guy. Mm -mm. He's other guy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have the culmination of then all the rumors of hearing rats because Dolores mentions rats. There's rats in the song. Rats, 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 rats. Uh, my thing is, why are y'all not taking care of that? That's very rude of you to let rats just ruin Casita like that. But <laughs> <laughs> Casita does not deserve rats. Casita does not deserve any of this. But we get to the moment where Mirabel goes into like behind the house. She's exp and she gives chase to a mysterious cloaked figure. Has a funny moment. Uh, and we get we. I think it's at that point now we're introduced to Bruno officially. Uh, John Leguizamo voicing Bruno uh, because we know Lin Manuel fought tooth and nail for this role. Oh, for so sure. So I gotta, I gotta wonder how John John uh, irked it out. Yeah, because like I, I look, mean, I'm at, happy. It's funny because like at first when I saw this movie, um, I thought it was Lin Manuel vo voicing Bruno because it literally like, you know, you just feel like a Lin Manuel role. It looks like him. Yeah. Yeah, you just kind of. It feel looks like, like he made the character for himself because he's in all his other movies. Yeah, but like, instead we get Luigi voicing um, <laughs> um, Bruno. Fun fact: we, live action Luigi from that really old Mario Brothers movie is Bruno. Live action Luigi, Sid the Sloth, and Chichi the Drag Queen in Two Men uh, Two Wong Fu. Mm -hmm. Like I love John Leguizamo. I I've actually watched a couple of his uh, like comedy specials as well. Yeah, like, he is he is a really good actor. I love him and stuff. Oh, he's also uh he's the cousin in Romeo plus Juliet. Oh, he is. Oh my gosh. He he's so good in that movie too. I love that movie as well. Join us in our next discussion for Romeo plus Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. Like we watched it in it's high school. Bad. Um, because we read the play, and then she's like, okay, so we're gonna watch the movie version of this, and it's a little, you know, weird. Different. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie so much. It's great. So cheesy. I love the scene where, uh, they, they just play Love Fool. Yeah, uh, The Cardigans oh Love Fool. Yeah. That song is also a banger. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mirabel meets Bruno. He's been living in the walls. He never left the house. And that's like the whole twisty doodle. Um, he, he had a vision when Mirabel didn't get her gift and he thought that Abuela was going to overreact, which psh, Abuela overreact. What? Well, she's totally not going to overreact. She, <laughs> only the most reasonable of Abuelas. <laughs> but so instead of running away, he stayed in the walls because he gets free food. He lives adjacent to the kitchen. And here's my thing. Encanto is a movie of painful two-word phrases. Like, there's just a lot of things in this movie that are uh, pretty painful. I would put, a, like, Dolores's I'm fine. That's a painful moment in this movie because uh, she's not fine. Uh, another really painful moment in this movie is uh, Bruno's plate. Yeah. Because uh, when they show that Bruno mm -hmm. drew himself a nice little plate into the table next to his family's set of ta of plates, <sighs> yeah, kind of kind of breaks your heart a little. Yeah, sadness. Right? Oh no! The worst one was when uh I saw this one where it made me realize that you know Bruno is a triplet. Like Julieta and Peppa are his twin sisters. They have the same birthday. Yeah. So when he ran away ten years ago. You know, Julieta and Peppa still had birthdays. They still had birthdays with their families. And those birthdays were taking place the same day as Bruno's birthday. That's so sad. he couldn't have anyone <laughs> around him, everyone else no. was enjoying the ball. Day. That, no, that's where I lost it. That's when Bruno's plate hit me, like, right in the guts. Like, oh, dude. Gosh. Ugh. 
that. But it, not just that. So, you know, he's spying on the family. He's trying to keep everyone safe. He's been patching the walls. He doesn't do the patching, actually. It's Hernando who does all the patching. <laughs> yeah. Um, and <laughs> he's Hernando, and he's scared of nothing. Um, and then you also find out that he's been living with the rats. The rats are kind of his rat baby children. He uh, he even has rat ratertainment. He uh, there's rat sports. There's a uh, rat news. Rat telenovelas. Rat, which is sports? amazing. I don't know. <laughs> he did the rat. Yeah. So <laughs> so Mirabel has a, a whole idea where it's like you know we'll do another vision. We'll figure out what the fuck is going on. You're Mister Future Man. Let's figure it out. So. But he's not convinced to, like, stay out of the walls forever. He just wants to help her out. Because he's a good deal. Like, a- as a fellow, as a fellow scrawny, secluded rat, rat Hispanic man, like, I sympathize. Like, I've been there. I know it. So. Right. <laughs> so they do a whole thing where Antonio shows up and is like, oh, the rats told me everything. You can use my room to do a vision. So they go to his tree house room to do a vision. It involves sand because they're making glass. This was a thing I didn't notice. And I guess it's talked about more in the... Because there's sequel books to this. Okay. Um, but I guess Bruno's vision caused him physical, physical pain. Like, I thought, like, he was grunting because, like, oh, the future is hard to read. But he's grunting because it hurts. I guess that was kind of, like, a thing or an aspect that was either, like, in concept or was, like not thoroughly explain but his gift isn't just like oh sees the future like he has a drawback to it in that it causes him physical pain to see the future which was like okay i'd also cool. imagine it's that little, if it's little not disney but yeah we'll do it i'd also imagine like if i'm someone who's trying to like you know look at premonitions and look into the future and it would i don't know cause it would take so much of my energy to do that yeah that would hurt me too right mm-hmm. so so they do the visiony thing, and it's revealed that Mirabelle has to hug her sister. She's got to hug Isabella, who she just fucked everything up for. <laughs> that's okay, because, you know, blood's thicker than water. F- fam for life. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Mirabelle decides to go talk to Isabel, Isabella, and we get the uh, <clears throat> best song in the movie. Where Isabella reveals that she didn't even want to marry that bitch. She just wanted, she just wants to live her own life. She wants to grow cool, fun cacti. Then why did uh, you say you wanted to marry him? Is it because of the generational trauma? <gasps> Could it be that? Could it be societal pressure? Familial pressure? Could it be all these things and more? Yes. Like, especially it is when. Absolutely that. Especially when it was pointed out that, like, Isabella and Mariano kind of look like Alma and Pedro when they were younger. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of get this whole thing of, um, and I think, I don't know if it's super confirmed, but I think Isabella is the firstborn grandchild, which, you know, for those not familiar with the cultural context of that in Hispanic families, it usually doesn't matter, uh, but the fir- uh, gender wise, but the firstborn grandchild is special. Like in just, ways within the family doesn't matter if it's if it's the oldest boy well then he's screwed like he's gonna have to like carry on the family legacy get married like have kids like he is literally the next in line to be the head of the family but he's also probably grandma's favorite and then oldest girl same concept it's gonna probably have to carry on the family all the burdens of the family like it's a mess if you're the oldest in a hispanic family good luck or in my family if because my older brother's the oldest boy and I'm the oldest girl. The two of us are just so competitive. We were so competitive with each other when we were younger. But then we didn't realize, Ooh. oh, all the societal and familiar pressure is getting to us. You know. <laughs> it's turning our relationship toxic. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, jeez. Don't want that. We're fine now. But, it's okay. <laughs> but back then, that's it's good. just like, oh... Instead of fighting each other, we should fight the patriarchal systems that allow these relationships <laughs> to untwa- un- unravel and pit us against each other. It's why I tell people to watch Revolutionary Girl Utena. Yes. Our fight is not with each <laughs> other. Our fight is with the systems that have pinned us against each other. Which is a great like, show. You're... I love Utena. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I always bring that up. Mm-hmm. I always find every every opportunity to try and bring it up in any of our discussions, I... even when not relevant. I gotta watch it again. It's been years. Ooh, same. 
Um, but I love what else can I do? I love it for the plant references. Um, I well let let me ask you: Are you team rose and rose of roses, or are you team uh, Flor de Mayo's by the mile? Ah, oh, team roses. So I was gonna say, like again, you might not like the man's style, but Lin Manuel is a lyrical mm-hmm. genius. Like this song, a hurricane of jacarandas. Who who <laughs> writes that? Who? Who thinks of that? It's so certainly good. not a white person. No, none of you gringos could. <laughs> none of you. I am no. I am laying that challenge heartily down. Oh none of you gringos could. None <laughs> of you gringos. <laughs> so good. Um, and then like her cactus is kind of technically a hidden Mickey. Always love yeah. to point those out. You gotta have hidden um, Mickey's in every Disney movie. God. I love how during the song like. Mita Bell starts it with like really insisting on that hug. Like she is just in it for mm. the, the miracle saving hug. And then just halfway through the song, she's like, what am I doing? Like, you know, like I'm here to help you out. So, you know, we find out that she's, she, Isabella doesn't want to be perfect. She doesn't want to do the pretty flowers. She wants to just grow all the weird, cool shit that she can. Um, you know, I, I, another great line is, uh, uh, what could I do if I knew it didn't need to be perfect? Yeah. It just had to be. Which a lesson that content creators out there, yes, people who have made stuff on maybe this channel, yes, we need to all take that to lesson. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll take it to art. I'll We're take all, it to art. Yes. Same, same, same. But yeah, I think it's super cool. Isabella, you know, lets go and releases her alt girl phase. Um, I believe there was even like concept art that she was supposed to have like another boyfriend, like a guy that she actually was in love with. Mm-hmm. And he was like, he was like a scrawny little nerd guy, as opposed to you know Mariano being you know this epitome of machismo. Who uh, she successfully manages to beat the shit out of him again, <laughs> which fun fucking times. I, I love how violent. Isabella's power is, which I, I guess now would be a fun time to talk about. Yeah. You know, the, the, the powers already tie into kind of how their personalities work. But I think that's just, you know, good character building. They, I, It really feels like they took the time to sit and think like, okay, if this character can hear everything, how would they act? What would they do? What would be the things they like? You can tell they kind of had a little powwow for each character, but right. um, it really is tied into like how those powers relate to their personality. But I think it also ties a bit more, like, plot-wise into, like, the nature of the miracle. And I know this is super reading into it way more than it needs to be. But, you know, consider that the candle didn't just give them their powers. Like, the candle also raised the mountains. Like, it pushed away the uh, the invaders that, ca- that caused them to leave their village in the first place. Like, the candle did a lot of – did a couple things. It didn't just give them the gifts. So the candle did a bunch of things that all point to, you know, to security. You know, it raised mountains to keep people out. It kicked out the invaders that were putting the family in immediate danger. So it makes kind of sense that the candle was working on this mission, on this uh, purpose of, you know, save the family, protect the family, or, you know, help keep everyone safe. Right. So I did see kind of, I did see kind of a neat idea that the powers kind of stem from also the ability to protect the village from future dangers. Um, Kind of in the sense that Bruno would be able to foretell danger coming ahead. Dolores and Camilo, as well as Antonio, all basically have perfect spying abilities. Um, And then Isabella, I know I kind of mentioned Omega level mutant. No, homegirl is the only Omega level (laughs) power here. Like the fact that she can grow any plant anywhere, any size, and she can use those plants to destroy people. Y'all need to be treating her a lot nicer because she could be snapping anytime soon. and You're going to have a really scary supervillain on your hands. And like, I don't think you're reading too much into this because I agree with everything that you're saying. Like, I think it's a perfectly, like, um, fine interpretation that I agree with. The way that the gifts on their stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Well, in the sense like that, and then the triplets. The triplets end up having powers that ver- feel very much like the needs of a mother. Yep. You know? Mm-hmm. Bruno can tell when danger is coming. Um, Peppa can 
I mean, with the weather, I mean, yeah, she's mostly u- it's used to like make it rain or make it up, but she's able to make good weather. She's able to provide like that safe weather, that safe environment. And then Julieta is able to heal, is fully able to remove wounds and heal wounds. Um, and I've seen a couple interpretations of that as well as those being powers on like a path of healing trauma as well. I mean, you kind of get a lot of that when literally one of the character's powers is physically healing. But, I mean, it, it, it it's true. I feel like they're, they, there's got to be at least that level. I feel that there was that level of thought put into it, obviously. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it's just the thing that I like a lot about the family. I think it's what adds to this being a great cast is that it's not just, okay, here are these characters. Okay, and they do powers. Like, th- there's things to them. Like, the super hearing person acts a certain way. The the shape-shifting person acts a certain way. And they're, they're, they relate to each other. I think it's another really good, strong move with this cast is that they are family. Everyone has a relationship dynamic with someone else. And it's different than a dynamic that the other members have. Like, right. Beppa and Mirabel have a relationship that's different than Antonio and, you know... Abuelas, like they're all. It's just a cool like relationship web that I feel like you know can very easily get expanded upon and explored more in sequel movies, in a right. you know Encanto series show or whatever with that. But uh, so Isabella has her moment that, again. That's kind of like like I said, a lot of these songs are used as revelations. We find out about Luisa. We find out about Isabella. I mean, we don't talk about Bruno, and like I said, I know I'm stretching on that one. That's more just to be like, oh, hey, here's what the family thinks of Bruno. But I think it also gives you, again, that exploration of what's Dolores doing behind the curtain there. It's like, hey, you ever notice how she's just kind of hanging out? Um, but you get all that. And wow. Abuela's not having it. Which, this is, again, very true, very... V- the representation, mm, the flavor... <laughs> uh, well, no, I remember that this is the scene that everyone was like, I wish I could talk to my abuela this way, but I know if I got three seconds into a conversation just like this, my mouth would be smacked five feet off my face. Like, Gosh. there would not be one chancla. There would be a barrage of chanclas <laughs> fired my way. A barrage of chanclas. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, but you do get this whole scene where Mirabel looks like she's healing the magic. She's you know, talking to her family members, finding about what's bothering them. That's making the miracle stronger. The cracks are going away. And again, Abuela is not having it because these are, this is not the way she wanted things to be done. These are not her rules. This is not her organization. And so she has a fight with Mirabel and Mirabel is like, I love my family. You don't love this family. And Abuela again, damn, realistically probably would have smacked her across the face at that (laughs) moment but you know disney so she's like no i love this family you're so they're having a fight there's actual literal rifts in their family they're reflected in casita and so i mean this is kind of where you have the whole moment where you know throughout the movie the powers are kind of freaking out luisa loses her strength for a little bit um yep you have the scene where mirabelle is behind the wall and kind of spooks peppa and that spooks Camilo, and he has this like weird like shape shift hiccup, right? Which I I think that's that's an also really good scene, even though it's literally three seconds. But it gives you probably like most of the characterization for Camilo that we know, other than likes likes to shape shift to by being a sneaky dude. For sure, is yeah. you see him taking care of his mom. You see him being that child that's the one that takes care of the mom when she has her anxiety moment so it's like oh you're that kid you're you're that sibling Mm -hmm. i mean it makes sense too with the whole transforming bit with the whole believing that bruno is the boogeyman it's like well yeah he's probably with his mom all the time taking care of her while she's venting and having an emotional time so yeah he would have picked up all of that stuff from being not like fully a mama's boy, but you know, being a caretaker towards his mom. So I, I love that in like that three second scene, you can kind of extrapolate a lot of fun little characterizations out of them. But um, you have the whole dark moment where Casita is just falling mm, apart. You get really cool Casita. stuff like the tile surfing. <laughs> you get the uh, the handrail turning into a ladder. Like I said, the Casita scenes are all just really good i think they're super fun even even the scary actiony ones where right. where casita's falling apart i think they're just so good and so imaginative 
but you know, yeah, yeah, the moment where the whole house falls apart. Um, I do think it's really interesting that that Casita also does like a whole last ditch, like let me just throw all the crap over Mirabel to cover her so she just doesn't get crushed. Right. Um, I like that. It's kind of fun. So, but it's, it's like uh, you know, um, in every single viewing of that movie, I always just get sad. Because, like, Casita just wants to be Casita. My sweet little Casita. And, like, the, and this is... the, the trauma and the emotional anguish that this family, like, has to go through is just hurting little Casita. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. Like, it works so much better mm -hmm. on the character's behalf to have Casita be nice to Mirabel. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't get this moment. We don't sure. get... If you had had a bully Casita, then this scene would mean <laughs> nothing. This scene would be, like, good. Like, <laughs> fuck that house. I know, you mentioned, so... I know you mentioned the possibility of having a bully Casita, but I'm laughing at it even more because it's just, like, bully Casita. <laughs> I mean, like in another timeline, yeah. It's so no welcome to the dick house. <laughs> it's like our house bullies my sister. Oh Gosh. my god, it'd be the worst reality show. <laughs> you just see me and a bell like try to go to the bathroom, the door just whoop out right in her face. Wow. Or or it does like owl house. It's like morning <laughs> Gosh. But it collapses, they don't save the candle, everyone loses their powers. Uh which, it, it's kind of cool in the scene, you sort of see where, like, Isabella tried to use vines to get up, and they just all went away. Yeah. Uh, Camilo tries to shapeshift, and it, it just doesn't work. Uh, so you have, like, those kind of fun scenes. Um, but like I said, I really thought they were going to do a lot more with the whole, like, the family having to face being powerless. I thought that was going to be more, like, their plot line. But I guess it was focusing more, obviously, on the individual stuff. It was focusing more on Mirabel. But... Um, it they do get to that moment where the house completely collapses, they lose all their powers, Sadness. and oh, P.S. The mountain has been cracked. Mm -hmm. So, with all that, everyone in the family is concerned about Mirabel, which I thought was super sweet. I thought it was super nice that like you know the house collapses and everything. Everyone's all like, "Where's the candle? Where's it?" And they immediately are all like, "Where's Mirabel?" So it's like, all right, good. We have redeemable members. Like, y'all are not monsters, thank God. Right. Um, they have the whole scene where they're searching. They bring the kids back. And even the kids are like, where, where is she at? Where did she go? So they're searching, they're searching. And lo and behold, she is found. She's found by Abuela. Hmm. And she's found at the exact spot where Abuela lost her husband. How? <laughs> what a coincidence that is. Hmm. It, it's almost like magic. Almost like <laughs> Disney magic. Um, and so then we have the moment where Abuela kind of decides to share her trauma. The original trauma. The source. The OG trauma. <laughs> that OG <laughs> original trauma. Uh, so Dos Origitas begins playing. Oh, gosh. Uh, so... So the thing is, and I didn't catch at first. So, you know, throughout the movie, uh, a butterfly is used as the symbol for the family. Mm -hmm. uh, Mirabel has it on her dress. It's all over the, the in the movie. It's on, like, if you watch the videos online of the soundtrack, there's the golden butterfly. So, so, so the mariposa, the butterfly, is the symbol of the family. And so then I think it is really neat that then the song here is uh dos origitas or two caterpillars <laughs> um, i'm already right? starting to tear up thinking about this it's so cute <sighs> it's so adorable it's the song is fantastic the first time you hear it when like what because again i saw it in the theaters mm -hmm. so i heard it saw it watched it no subtitles just oh man very sad spanish song that i'm kind of picking up the word here or there yeah then on like rewatch number three, where I'm like, I'm gonna let, well, I have the subtitles on, and then you actually read the subtitles and they're translated, and you're like, no, yeah, no, Abuela wasn't prepared for Crystalis. She she wasn't ready for a future together. No, <laughs> it's so uh, sad. Oh my God, it's awful. This is I okay. So I would put this song over. Remember me 
and not just remember me. I mean, yeah. I mean, Coco singing "Remember Me" to Abuela. Mm-hmm. Sad. Like I would put dos origitas sadder. So this hit me way more than than "Remember Me." "Remember Me" was okay. "Remember Me" was actually kind of like my favorite part mm-hmm. of Coco because I actually don't really like the music from Coco. Like really, Poco Poco Loco and all the other ones. Well, I'm also not a big Tecate like. In terms of like Mexicany, Mexicany like mm-hmm. music, like like where you can smell the carne asada being cooked <laughs> in the back of the truck, like I it's uh, it's a good like, smell though. I okay, God, you're making me want carne asada always, always and forever. But like, I'm not the biggest fan of that ki- kind of Mexican music. So when that was like the whole soundtrack for Coco, I was like, oh, well, okay, that's fine, that's okay. But that's why, I, and that's also where I was kind of like iffy on Encanto, where I was like, I don't know, I didn't really like the 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 Mexican movie Disney made. Am I gonna like the Colombian movie Disney made? Yeah. But it's thank thankfully one eighty one. Mm-hmm. Like Coco's still okay, but it's definitely not a movie I watch, and I have not watched. I've watched Encanto already more times, and that movie's Same. only been out for like a month. Same. Oh, it's only been out for a month. Thanks to Disney Plus. Um, instantly. So yeah. So we get the backstory. She was just a poor little village girl, and she saw a man. You know, he was a boy. She was a girl. Could we make it any more obvious? <laughs> and then they had triplets. And then, what oh Armed conflict? Uh-oh. And, and before anyone. So, like, these attackers could be many things. But I think it was really silly when people were like, oh, no, those are the conquistadors. Or they were like, oh, no, those are the Europeans. And, like... <laughs> You've got your timeline all yeah. mixed up. So, like, it, they could be a bunch of million things. It's pretty ambiguous. But just know that there, while there are no wrong answers, saying that those are Europeans is the wrong answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, so they, they, have, they have to leave their home. And that's the thing, like, despite this being a movie based on Columbia, on Columbia's history, on a very Colombian experience – displacement due to violence and displacement due to war is all too common <laughs> in Central and South America. Yep, Either absolutely. at the hands of like the nation's own people or unfortunately at the hands of other nations much bigger and more powerful trying to you know fulfill their own self-interest. But mm-hmm. I mean I just think it is very fitting and it is very appropriate that you know in this movie that is reflecting like you know the traumas of of you know latin families of latin culture and those people that you know violence and displacement due to violence and having to leave places due to violence that that is part of that narrative because oh, that is yeah. still it's still happening probably today. the biggest it's still happening this is still the biggest like contact that you know most americans will have with this type of culture i mean to this day, we still have to remind people that there are kids in cages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry that the Disney movie yep. discussion like has to go dark and talk about serious shit. But no, there are kids in cages in America from people trying to flee conflict. So, so yeah. So, I, I, and I think that, and I know it's another sad thing where it's like, oh, people will think differently because a Disney movie came out. But this has happened before. This has totally happened where literally a stupid movie showing a, a conflict or showing a concept of an issue has actually changed people's mind to actually help them conceptualize it and think about it. So, like, yeah, I'm glad this was included. And I'm glad that this is discussed. I'm glad it's done so powerfully as probably one of the best sad scenes in Disney movies. Yeah. Like, like Bambi's mom can it, eat it. <laughs> Bambi's mom can eat it. Yeah, it's like, it's it's so truthful because like a lot of immigrant children in the last several decades and granted this has been happening for a very long time but like especially like in the last few decades where we've seen more immigrants enter the united states like we're escaping like traumas because like a lot of a lot of people come to the united states because they're more they're more like opportunities here because like peru's history in the 80s wasn't the best and it got worse after my parents left but it's always this thing of like, you know, fleeing and living the dream. But like that's so having to like upkeep like and staying strong, it's it can be traumatic. And it is traumatic. 
it's sad. It really is. Just the the simple act of losing everything alone mm-hmm. is pretty traumatic. Yep. Like most, I mean, well, whereas most people won't experience, you know, having to leave due to war and violence. So, things that are more common are losing things like natural disaster, yep. losing things to fire, losing things to other people. Like more people are probably familiar with loss. Yeah. But it's it's that added caveat that you then are in such danger that you have to leave everything mm-hmm. that you have to. And in some cases leave to places where you might not even know if you survive. Yeah. Um, something from something from my own family is that my grandmother left Mexico. Um, she was originally in the Chihuahua area, but she left Mexico to come to America. She left uh, Mexico with six kids wow. by herself. Wow. So my grandma and she was undocumented. Her kids were all documented because she had come to America to have them and then went back to Mexico. So, yes, my parents, my dad is an anchor baby, but th- that's just how immigration works, guys. Like, the whole chain migration thing is an illusion. But, no, my grandma came to America with six kids, no man, by herself, and decided she was going to make a better life for her in America. And she basically raised an entire family. Like, all six kids had grandkids, and I have tons of cousins, and it's a whole family that we have here in America because one woman had no fear and gave no fucks. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so again, like, that also made it very personal just because it was a similar story to what my own family has had to do, that, like, this was trauma that my family has experienced. And uh, it's, it's happened. <laughs> no magical powers, mm-hmm. unfortunately, <laughs> but... It's it's happened with my family, too, because, like, um, actually, my dad and mom never moved to the United States together. My dad actually went first, and he left my mom. They mutually decided that, like, you know, it was just the best situation they could do for now. But my dad went to New Jersey first, and my mom and him had a long-distance relationship for four years. And mind you, oh, this wow. was the 80s. There was no Discord, <sighs> no Skype. The only thing they were writing letters they wrote letters and they had telephone cards and they could <gasps> only call each other for 20 minutes every month oh my God. like if Do i have, have my boyfriend saved? now i would die and my mom had to Do live you... with that trauma and, and she knew that like it was for a better life they wanted kids and like you know they wanted a better family but she lived with that for four years and then she was finally able to go through like my dad worked in jersey as a factory worker again it's undocumented he's documented now but like he worked in a factory in jersey and he lived with like 10 papers people are papers guys 10 people like, in a fuck it <laughs> he lived with 10 people in a small apartment and then he took the train he didn't fly he took the train down the amtrak from jersey all the way to georgia <laughs> And, and I mean, and, and yet people wild. still lived their fucking lives yeah. sitting around with the dumbass idea in their head that immigrants are lazy. We're not fucking like, lazy. Fuck off. <laughs> fuck off. Fuck off. And then my mom Get was able to move to the States and nine months later, my older brother was born. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Literally then, nine then months later. You guys' American story truly starts. <laughs> like she um. moved, she moved in like December of 92 and my brother's birthday, September of 93. <laughs> Uh, that was a, that was pretty quick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's so. my favorite fun fact in my family. <laughs> yeah. No, I like a I like a good American like American family story. It beats the hell out of well, my grandfather's been here seven generations. Like, okay, cool. Okay, cool. Bye. If you're boring, just say that. <laughs> so no, but the scene is really good too. So powerful. But you know, I had put a pin in it at the very beginning. Is that it's really we it's a replay of what we saw at the beginning of the movie but there's some differences like we get to see the scenes where abuela like actually like collapses and screams out uh as the the candle like releases the miracle we see the actual miracle like mm-hmm. take out the the armed men so to me what i was taking that as was very much at the beginning, we were seeing probably more what was Mirabel's understanding mm-hmm. of what her abuela went through. You know, you grow up, you hear the stories that your abuela tells you of, you know, 
in my case, it was like, oh, I came from Mexico, or you hear her tell the story. And so I'm sure, so like, that's what I'm saying. She still has the main point. She still has the negative point that, you know, her grandma had to flee. Abuelo was there. And then there was no Abuelo. And so Abuela had to go on. And you get those moments in the beginning scene. But it's not until you get to the scene at the end that you get, like I said, the specifics. You get how Abuela was feeling. You get what happened at that moment. So I think it's kind of more her filling in the gaps there. That, you know, Mirabel had mm-hmm. that, you know, foundational understanding of what her grandma went through. But she needed the details to be like, oh, no, these are specific, you know, trauma-related responses. It was when she was able to put it together that th- this wasn't just her being mean, but that she was responding and being mean. So, mm-hmm. I- again, that's also what adds to how powerful it is. That it isn't just, look how sad this scene is, but it is very much a uh, a scene of understanding. It's, a, it's meant to be a scene of empathy. You're supposed to yep. watch this and feel the emotion for her, for the family. Because now you understand that all of it, all of the arguing, all of the insecurities, all of the, mm-hmm. you know, the need to uphold and be of a certain type all comes from Abuela having to go through that moment of losing just about everything. Mm-hmm. And I say just about because then that becomes her lesson is that, you know, the gift wasn't the magical powers. Like your daughter being able to control the weather doesn't mean shit. It's about the actual family that you are able to rebuild and have in your new home. Yep. Like, Mm -hmm. that's the gift. The family is her gift that she gets to have and that she needs to take care of and that she's been neglecting. Not neglecting, but just, you know, that that toxicity. It's that weird thing where, like, you, you come to this understanding that what she is doing is still not good, but why she is doing it is also not good. It's also not like her fault it's also not of a conscious malicious intent so again it's where like we're back to who's the villain like who's the bad guy in this movie and it's like i i I would honestly argue like in that broad you know theatrical way in the same sense that like love can be a theme i i believe trauma can genuinely be the antagonist of this movie like Mm -hmm. it's just if you hurt people that makes bad things happen and sometimes those bad things are that person starts hurting other people Uh it's just sort of a that's just sort of how what i kind of get out of you know how how it's all set up and how everything's characterized like but, you, you nailed and, and it. And then, so, so yeah, the scene ends, and you're just left in tears. And then, oh the, the, yeah, I was, the I was bawling. Shows up. I, was so, I was crying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the vocals didn't help but either. It doesn't help. It's so, so good. It's amazing. But we get that. It sounds like a love song my mom would play if she was cleaning the kitchen. It's <laughs> this whole soundtrack is just house cleaning music. Yeah. Like this is a soundtrack <laughs> that I can hear blaring at 8:30 on Saturday yeah. morning. All I want to do is sleep, but Ma's telling me. Ya son las siete. I was supposed to be up at seven. I know. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> God, and, that's, and I still I'll call a uh, uh, bachata music. I call it house cleaning music. Fight me. I don't care. <laughs> Uh, I've I've listened to enough salsa to to know that that is just house cleaning music. Absolutely, it's, the only thing that's good for it is cleaning and maybe dancing if you do that. <laughs> for cleaning and dancing, ooh, the combo, yeah, yeah, the double. But Mirabel forgives. Is that the right word? Her her grandma. I would say forgive, or at least like come to an understanding yeah. of like where she's coming from. I mean, there's there's strong familial empathy. Mm-hmm. I feel yes. like there's at the very least that. Yes. Like, Mirabel is now at this point that, like, I've been made to feel shitty, but it's because the people who made me feel shitty also had to feel really shitty. It's not the best lesson, mm-hmm. but this is where, you know, Mirabel being the bigger person is kind of, if she at any point had chosen not to be the bigger person, we would just have a completely <laughs> different movie. Yeah. Uh, maybe a funner move, but <laughs> she, she goes full heart. She goes full better person, bigger person. Um, we get... You know, some more Bruno comedy. Gotta love that. Like, he's set up as a villain when he is, like, fully coded in this movie as comic relief. Mm-hmm. Like, every other word, every other line is meant to be funny, which is, I think, funny. Um, but I do like the whole, like, he comes to try and defend his niece. 
And then then his ground then his mom actually his mom just is just happy to see him again. Yeah. Which um I I know I saw some weird discourse online where people were talking about how like basically a lot of people were having issue with people head canonizing a lot of the characters as LGBT. Yes, I did hear about that. Mm -hmm. Which some of them are are problematic and probably are an issue. I know a lot of the ones that were not very tasteful were the ones of Louisa. Yeah, uh, just in being masculine was like, oh, she's she's trans. Which and then and it's already been argued plenty mm -hmm. that like that's it's it's not the best head canon in that sense just because. Uh, women already, especially women of color, have to deal with like these standardizations of masculine and femininity uh -huh. traits to where yeah, uh -huh. it's tough being a masculine mm -hmm. woman. It's even tougher to be a masculine woman of color. Mm -hmm. So like, so to make it a whole world, it's because she's trans. It kind of, uh, you can see where I that's also, not, and, it's not the nicest taste. And this is something <laughs> that like I had a discussion with, um, with one of my friends. It's also the issue of like, this movie is like we've we've said this so many times before but this movie's like representation of hispanic culture for us you know for latinos who don't really get the scope of representation that is seen in encanto often in mainstream media and for someone else or to ever. just come in and just take that you, you you get what i'm saying though like yeah it's just kind of like uh okay all right. And that's and that's not to say like head cannons. Well, yeah, of course. That these are that like oh no, you can't believe this. You can't theorize mm -hmm. this. It's just more that you, you should know that like it, it's not a some of these things are not fully free for all. Yes. Like mm -hmm. this is I, I mean, I, I know it's kind of ironic given like the composer, but it's like that whole Hamilton vacation. You know how it was like, "Oh no, George Washington is actually a demisexual." Like it's not like let's not do that. Like, especially when there's already you know, struggles and characterization already in place yeah. for this character. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't got to be throwing, you know, a gay cherry on top. Like, no, there's already a trauma Sunday here. Like, we're good. <laughs> a trauma Sunday. Oh gosh. Right. But but like on on that flip side, like on that flip side though. Mm -hmm. Like I said, as as a fellow scrawny <laughs> scrawny rat Mex Hispanic man myself. I see a lot of, you know, the the gay story in the whole Bruno arc there. You know, you yeah. just have this moment where Bruno has these things about him. Again, his gift is a thing that he was born with. You have these things where he's judged based on this thing that he's been born with. It causes tension between him and his mother. He leaves because he assumes the worst of her assuming the worst, only for them to just come back together. And really, she just wanted him to be around all along. Like, that's the ideal, and you want it to work out that way. Mm -hmm. But I know that's just one of many, <laughs> like, queer paths that occur. But I felt like if there was a character that kind of, like, had that touch, it was more Bruno's, like, mm -hmm. plot line there. I mean, it's it's helped that, again, he's... He's single throughout the movie, but it's again because he's a loner rat man living in a hole. But you know, same. Um, but I, I do think it's super sweet that at the end, you know, Abuela just does have that unconditional motherly love. Mm -hmm. She's toxic for sure, but she loves her kids. Yep. So it, again, we're we're back to the whole. It's it's like loving your own grandma. It's like it's a little yikesy, but uh, we love you. It's like I still um, love you, mom. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> like my me trauma is su trauma. Me trauma uh, su trauma. Love you. Me trauma su trauma. But so once they have Mirabel, once Abuela has been forgiven, everyone decides to go back to the house. Everyone's forgiven. Well, not house. Sorry, Camilo did say that they have a not house, which is true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I do like how the solution is that everyone in the town, you know, pulls together. You know, because they, they've been relying on the superpower family this whole time. Yeah. I think it's kind of nice that some of them decide to lift a shovel or two. Oh, and uh, sorry, I kind of forgot because I had mentioned it earlier. I know we're going way, way far back. But um, again, some of the songs do have like weird double like extra meanings in like other language versions. So uh, like Isabella's song, What Else Can I Do? In, in Spanish... It's called a uh, uh, seda inspiración. So mm -hmm. is this inspiration? Yeah. And so it gives her more of a, the song is kind of more of a it it gives her more of like an artist angle, like more of 
she's someone who was able to make the 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 beautiful gorgeous flowers but now that she's been having to make the flowers she's not inspired by it it's kind of the whole like being an artist became her job and so she's looking for that inspiration that 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 thing that again makes her feel life out of her gift again and so you don't really get that out of the english version but in the spanish version just the fact that she's singing about her inspiration mm-hmm. and stuff it's like whoa like that's that's almost a completely different song it kind of adds a whole different cuz like yeah you have the whole she doesn't want to get married aspect right. again that also got weirdly like coerced into a whole like oh she must be a lesbian then it's like you know people cannot want to marry one person and like be fine right yeah (laughs) for sure but um but i did like how that one has a different change and i think uh another one is when they're singing the song while uh fixing up the house when they're fixing up casita there's a little weird translation thing when they find the doorknob about how uh i think in the english they say like they made it like we made this doorknob for you yeah so it's kind of cute it's it's cute that it's the family member saying oh like this is our gift to you Mm -hmm. of you getting a gift and then in the spanish it's more of that they say that they found the doorknob or like the doorknob was here so it becomes more of like a a thing that like mitabel like earned it or like mitabel like just got something that was like always already there interesting it's it's, it's interesting. interesting it's yeah fascinating and so that's kind of why i wanted to bring it up mm-hmm. i know like it was weird to go all the way back to isabella song, but it was it was only because like i forgot to make the point that uh a lot of the songs have these weird like extra nuances in one the spanish version and i'm sure you'll have other things for other languages yeah. but i mean in a movie that takes place in colombia i <laughs> just find it very interesting that the Spanish version of all the music just adds more depth to to the characters, and I think that's really neat and fun. I'm gonna just have to go back but... and like look at all the Spanish lyrics and stuff. Like I've already looked at Dos Orgullitas because that was already in Spanish entirely, and like I just look at the English translated lyrics. But like everything else, like I gotta go back some time and just like review that. I mean, we don't talk about Bruno is literally the same song. It, it's same things. It's mm-hmm. it's actually. <laughs> a lot better but no i was saying some of them it, i think and it's mostly the, the the one person songs i like i said i don't know if it's fully on the whole translation side that they're like oh well this just with these words it fits the rhythm even though it's slightly off but like, i don't know i think it kind of adds a lot of good fun uh details to a lot especially like i said especially the the individual character songs where they're singing about like personal shit and it's like ooh, fun mm-hmm. for sure um and and so yeah, and then her getting the doorknob for the house. I know that kind of has its own like set of discussions as well as to like does that mean that Casita as a whole is her door? Yeah. Or that like she doesn't need a room because she has the whole house. Do the doors not mean anything anymore now? Because everyone's on the door. And so there's a lot I, I get, and I think it's super cool. Like, it, it's one the magical realism. Of like it's everyday life. Why are we going to explain it? But also just kind of, just kind of keeps your brain going instead of the movie, especially a kids movie, being like, and then the magic particles worked to like instead it's just, and then she got magic. Cool, done, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, the the whole combination. She doesn't get a gift, which I I think is the right decision yeah. and is the obvious decision. But I know some people who really love their traditional storytelling tropes i understand that i'm not knocking it that were a bit upset that she didn't get like a gift she didn't get like a power she has a it's gift like, it's you... just not in the form of a power <laughs> that's what i was saying it's like we all not watching the movie she can literally talk to any member of this family figure out what's bothering them and takes action to fix that problem yep. Like that's the gift. It's counseling. It's it's relating. It's empathy. It's all of those things and more. Like that's way better than being able to talk to animals. She can actually talk to people. Yep. Um, and then uh, and then you have the uh, the the little Bruno rap at the end that definitely solidified the whole uh, uh, theory that that Lin Manuel really wanted to be Bruno because <laughs> it's even it's even in his register. Yeah. It's mm. literally because. It, it's because he he doesn't have like the widest range i know people like to be like her her he he's not good at music he can't sing his own songs it's like it doesn't matter it literally doesn't matter <laughs> like it does not matter 
so but like but no the, the fact that like that rappy bit is in his register it's very uh <clears throat> you wanted this part didn't you especially since there he's not anywhere else in the movie like if he was playing another character there'd be like a less credence to it but he's not in the movie and he's always in the movie he's like stan lee always in the movie and he's not so i don't know but and then uh the ending song too is where uh dolores like fully just admits that hey i knew he was in the walls i mean she says it in the song but <laughs> yeah. she's saying it in a very quiet rap but she says that she's known the whole time which We'll bring up several points. One, if you were able to keep the secret that your uncle was living in the walls, why couldn't you keep the secret that, you know, your sis- your cousin went to go talk to him for more than five minutes? Like, seems kind of weird. I, I don't know. I don't know either. I just, but, I just blame it on Disney. I don't know. <laughs> just, just blame it on Disney. I blame everything but on Disney. But it did lead to, pro- <laughs> right? But it did lead to my favorite uh, fan theory. Like, this is still my all-time favorite is that, uh, you know, uh, so once Bruno leaves his hidey hole, you know, he obviously moves back in with the family. Mm-hmm. He becomes one with the family. They have family game night. He gets his own plate. No more drawn plate. We don't do that <laughs> shit no more. Uh, but you know Bruno had rat telenovela night with the rest of the family. Yeah. And I can just picture him. <laughs> Showing everyone his rat novellas, and Dolores is sitting there with like her, her like, her the side of her face like on her fist, like to the side, like there, bored. And everyone's like, "What's up?" And she's like, "Ah, oh, these are reruns. I've seen these already." <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I like that. That's really like, funny. <laughs> like, so good. Or that, or uh, he goes out into the village and he entertains the villagers with his rat novellas and he makes people's lives better by you know doing little rat puppet shows and thus his gift was in fact acting as it may he used his acting to make people feel better yes <laughs> uh, that's what i was saying like dolores is this weird like cove of just lore and theories i mean i mean it's what happens when you basically admit that no this character hears everything and admitted at the end knew everything it's like what (laughs) yeah especially when like you know the main plot of the movie was a mystery yeah like what is happening to the miracle so i think that's hilarious that at the end it's like oh no 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 we had a character that knew the whole fucking time but she was just a little too distracted by a broken heart that gets fixed and we're all very happy for her because uh, Dolores is probably my favorite cousin. Well, you know, like, fiction, like, if that were to be the solution, then we wouldn't have an hour and a half movie. <sighs> the whole thing would Damn just it, resolve right. itself in, like, 20 minutes. <laughs> Are you telling me that drama can be averted and diminished with effective and clear communication? Yes, I'm talking to Disney and 99% of wrestling storylines. <gasps> Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> Why suplex Damn. your enemy into a table when you can just talk it out? Be friends. <laughs> like, I mean, would, would wrestling really survive if everyone could be friends? It's like that one Simpsons thing. It's like, could you imagine a world without lawyers? <laughs> everyone holding hands. Yeah. <laughs> Family together. Um, like I said, no bad guy needed to get destroyed. There's nope. no dragon at the end. No big dragon that gets fought here, so... All of you that are mad about dragons showing up at the end of the movies, don't worry. There is not a dragon at the end of Encanto. But but there's a, a happy family that, that comes together. Uh, they all love each other still. Bruno makes his nice little uh, Frozen reference. I don't know if it's really one, but it's kind of one. Right. And then the family's all together. And then uh, so then you have the credits roll. And then you have uh, Colombia Mi Encanto, which that's another good song. Like... Mm-hmm. literally every song banger banger another banger another club except with those orgullitas, you'd be crying at the club so i'm always crying at the club anyways <laughs> so now it's just like it <laughs> it's fucking like i said two word phrases bruno's plate dos origuitas just a, a movie of sad times sad times Generational trauma. All the generational Love trauma. Love casita. Uh, what are some of the two word phrases? Um, more coffee. More coffee. Um, vamos, vamos. And yeah. 
<laughs> bad grandma. No. <laughs> oh God. Good good dads though. Both mm-hmm. of the dads in this movie are actually all three dads because even Pedro is is pretty cool. But you know it, it's very rare. Usually you know Disney movies got to have, especially now with the Marvel movies, bad dads. Bad dads everywhere. The bum- the bumbling dad. <laughs> They're not even bumbling anymore. They're just straight up not around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're just straight up bad. But. No, this one good, good dads, good Colombian dads, good fathers. <laughs> bueno padres, buenos padres, padres buenos. Right. So yeah, and then that's the whole movie. And usually at that point is when I start uh, starting it up to rewatch it again. <laughs> <laughs> Was it all but over not, again? Not this time. I fucking adore this movie. I fucking adore the soundtrack. I I can't wait for like the extended character stuff. I I mean, Encanto talk has been wild for the last couple weeks. So, mm-hmm. I mean, even just like the fan response to it. Like I'm super glad that I mean, you mentioned it that I'm super glad we're not in the Tumblr-y days cuz god, could you oh, imagine the like Oh my gosh. Could you yeah. imagine the like, <laughs> "Oh, here's my here's my person Sona for Casita." And it's like, "Could you not? Could you take that?" And not do it. Casita says. Plus, you know Bruno would get one slurred so hard. Yeah, one so slurred. See, si, casi, casita lurred. <laughs> I guess casita lurred. Because there was like one slurp and there was also like one sassed. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah the whole. Just wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, internet. You crazy. You mm-hmm. wild. Gosh. But I'm sure hoping we get some more. I mean, we're definitely going to get more stuff like this. And I'm just hoping like. Because Disney's on this pr- a pretty good track record in terms of this types of stuff. Like, even outside of, like, Hispanic representation. Like, the fact that we get all kinds of cool stuff, like Turning Red and, like, Raya, The Last Dragon. Right. So, I mean, Disney is trying to definitely put their best foot forward. Like, they know that a global audience is who they need to be hating now. And I'm glad that they understand that that now means more than just, like... Not not to knock specifically on these characters, but it's more than just like the Incredibles family. It's more than mm-hmm. just Papa, Mama, and, and the wee young ones. So, but definitely, I'm I'm looking forward to more fun stuff. I whatever movie Lin Manuel makes his crazy kooky tunes to next, I'm probably have no choice but to listen to. <laughs> uh, I feel all sad too because now that we know that they're gonna do. Well, we don't know if they're going to do one, but they've done so far specific national movies for Central and South America. Like Coco was a very Mexican movie. Yeah. And Godpo is a very Colombian movie. Uh, it makes me think that, like, who knows? They could be pushing the envelope and try to do other, you know, uh, Latin nation specific movies. Uh, I'm a little disappointed because, I mean, we already know they're just going to have Lin Manuel do the music for the Puerto Rico movie, yeah. whatever they do. <laughs> like, there's literally no other choice. Nope. Like, there's no, there's no anticipation, no mystery. Like, we already know who's going to make the mo- the music, but I'll look forward to it. I'll be there. I'll watch it. Disney, I I know you've already technically done Peru with the Emperor's New Groove, but do another one do it again <laughs> do more <laughs> it's like fuck it, it it was how long between saludos amigos and three caballeros oh, to then gosh, get yeah. to to then get to emperor's new groove like we had a <laughs> drought there yeah and fuck those th- those first two movies were only made because the united states was just trying to stop communism from spreading in Latin and South America. Like we were trying to stop communism any way possible. And that just happened to involve bullets in Vietnam and uh, movies for the rest of the world, I guess. Yep. But thankfully now we can have good, wholesome Disney movies about trauma that are not a ploy to uh, stop the spread of communism. And really that's all we can hope for. And here's me hoping. (laughs) Alrighty. (laughs) Final thoughts on the Encanto. On the Encanto? Well, the Encanto and the gift was really the friends you made along the way. Let's not forget that. <gasps> oh, wow. <laughs> it was the family members we traumatized along the way. I kn- I get it. <laughs> yeah. So obvious. Encanto, very relatable. 
I loved it. It's funny because like the more we discussed Encanto, the more I was like, ah, oh, wow, I love it even more. <laughs> that's just me. Yeah, like that's part of so much of my enjoyment was I would be like, that's just like someone I know. That's just like something I do. Yep. That's it was like I said, it was so much of just how familiar and how relatable it was and like i know for some people they can see it as like just a pandering type thing like oh haha that character had spicy chips that's a that's a pandery deal but no bro <laughs> like they were eating the right spicy chips they they got it right uh, but they should be eating the takis that's what <laughs> they should be eating the takis but i'm i'm super glad that we have a movie with a fun cast fun fun music Fun themes, fun. I I say that, but in in, in the sense that, like, you know, more movies to get, especially, like we said, Hispanic families that deal with trauma, that are dealing with trauma. This is something that, in in the chintziest way possible, can open those doors, those lines towards communication of trying to actually resolve and, like, heal real life trauma. Yep. And I feel like, you know, that's kind of one of the more powerful reasons to depict things like trauma and stuff is to then have it be used as a way to deal with the real life versions of that, to talk about it, to give those examples. So, you know, really glad that we have this movie, really glad that it's a success because, you know, this could have been like another Meet the Robinsons type thing where you have this really good, wholesome family movie that just disappears kind of falls apart and no one fucking remembers and you're not sure why i remember meet the robinsons i always dude i love that movie every time my favorite is still when the bad guy is explaining how how a bully he was in high school it's like they hated me hey hey gooby nice binder (laughs) want to come to my house after practice they loathe me (laughs) uh yeah so good Oh, P.S. Watch Meet the Robinson. Let, let's just have that be the moral of Encanto. It's not watch Encanto. You probably already have. The lesson of this is actually to go watch Meet the Robinson. Yeah, absolutely. We should talk about Meet the Robinsons next. <gasps> Ooh, that'll be a fun one. We can always do that. That'd be a very fun one. Uh, give me an excuse to rewatch it. Same. I mean, I don't need an excuse, but I'll always rewatch it. <laughs> All right. So I guess that's just about it. It was a blast talking about you know all this representation and all this trauma we've had to go through this was this was a real journey and i really enjoyed it so i want to thank you for for joining me and and discussing and and bringing your experiences it was really fun yeah of course no problem i love discussing this kind of culture (laughs) it's awesome it's it's the best it's not just spicy food y'all um so then i guess (laughs) Anything you want to plug? Any where we should send the children so that they can watch the listen to the? Yeah. So if you're wondering where's Caro been this whole time, <laughs> um, I write about wrestling now. So if Yay. you want to check out wrestlein.com, if you're into that, um, you can. Otherwise, you can find me on Twitter at Caro Taro, and there are two underscores in between Caro and Taro. And yeah, that's what I do. Also, 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 occasionally I do a um, podcast with um, my best friend in the entire world and my squishy, Clement. So if you go to his channel, y'all know, you know, y'all know where his channel is. We do C-squared. Um, I love C-squared. Just, do I just want to I have to book him. Just want to interject. I am a fan. I love watching you guys. Good shit. Oh, Oh, it's so sweet of you. All right. Sweet moments, y'all. Okay. So, like we said, hopefully tomorrow or the next day or, you know, whenever we decide to upload another thing, it'll be more appropriate, more more sonic to all of your your tastes. But uh, thanks all of you who stuck it out uh, and hung out with us while we talked about Encanto. Uh, and of course. We hope you'll... Come around to watch us talk about more shit. Who knows what it'll be? It might be something fun. Who knows? Bye. Who knows? But for now, the gringos can come back. For now, come we back. we'll 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 give a we'll give the gringos back their uh their channel. We'll hide the <laughs> the hot sauce. I'm already I'm already yep. putting my uh, my cuatro back under this desk. Adios. Bye. Ciao.